Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for June 29, 2015. We start with, we have our consent agenda, which means it should go pretty smoothly, but we'll see. So, first of all, the minutes of the meeting, June 8th and June 18th. Uh, number two, the request for a contractor drain layers license, Pave Tech LLC out of Newton. Another request for contractor drain layer license, Joseph Cardillo and Sons out of Wakefield, and another one for GW Gately, Gately Inc. out of Wilburn. Reappointments. Reappointments, we don't require the person to be here when they're first appointed. We do ask them to be here. Our Board of Library Trustees, reappointment, Heather Calvin and Diane Gordon. Board of Youth Services, Cindy Sheridan, Commission on Disabilities, Kerry Fallon, Michael Rademacher. Council on Aging, Ma Mara Klein Collins, Richard Phelps, Human Resources Board, Sheila Rawson, Park and Recreation Commission, Jennifer Rothenberg and Donald Vitters. Any members of the board have anything to say on any of those items? Move approval. Second. Move approval second. Is there anybody here wishing to speak on any of those or any of those reappointments? Are you here with us tonight? You didn't have to be, so God love you. I know you're among the millions watching at home. Uh, moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Ms. Mahan. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next, we have a time certain hearing, so we'll do that first. Uh, the Mystic View, uh, 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 Mystic View Terrace, a request to repair to private way and the betterment order, and I see some of my neighbors out here in the audience. Um, who's gonna present on this? Huh? Richard, are you speaking for the group? Come on down. You'll recognize this accent, but you're about to hear it from South Boston. <laughs> Richard. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for giving us the opportunity to present. Um, my eight uh, neighbors, including myself, uh, are residents uh, of Mystic View Terrace. Um, we know that the terrace uh, uh, has not been paved in 34 years. Um, it got significantly damaged during the winter uh, weather. And it's really a public safety issue at this point to, to fix it. So uh, all abutters uh, are on board. Uh, we have a contractor. We, we, we had three bids. And we also have paid careful attention to drainage, which is an issue on the hill. And so uh, I guess we're, we're asking for the go ahead. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Uh, questions? Yes. Yeah. I just want to double check on one of, uh, I understand that everyone signed it, uh, but there's one of these that uh, the residents of seven Mystic Terrace, they hadn't, they aren't marked down as having signed it yet. Can you just confirm that they did, it's the, sorry, um, um, Brandon and Paula yeah. Kindle? They signed the petition yeah. and uh, he's certainly been involved in the discussions. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really know. Okay. Uh, well, he's not actually living on Mystic View Terrace, that's why. His that's house. True actually is down on, uh, I forget what the But he's the property owner it's, it's of the other seven. It's a rental. OK. Home. All right. Thank you. OK. Others? No. Anybody else? OK. Nice to see all my neighbors. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, it's a go. We should have Very a block much. party to celebrate this. <laughs> At your house, Richard. <laughs> I'm sure Eileen would say OK. <clears throat> And so, you know, we all have been rocked by this past week having two deaths uh, from an overdose. And um, Adam um, and Chief Ryan asked to come before us uh, tonight to talk about this and to uh, how can we help? What can we do? We feel uh, hopeless. And Adam, of course, going, I mean, um, Fred, uh, our chief going above and beyond, has brought our district attorney, Mary Ryan, with him here tonight, along with Sean Garbley, our rep. So let me turn it over to Chief Ryan at this point in time. Fred. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, it is a difficult topic to be here on, um, and, and one that I, I, I wish I didn't have to speak publicly about, but last week was a very difficult week. Uh, in Arlington, we had three overdoses, two of which were fatal. Uh, one was a 27-year-old male, the other was a 21-year-old young lady. Um, year to date in um, this year, we've had 15 o uh, overdoses on heroin, uh, nine of which, and I, I really want to emphasize this, nine of which 
were revived by our firefighters and paramedics. Um, th it could have been nine other fatals right there were our firefighters not carrying uh, the Narcan and, and doing the heroic work that they do every day. Um, by comparison to uh, calendar year 2014, uh, we had 14 the entire year. So we've already surpassed, and if we continue to trend this way, we'll double what we had in 2014. I should point out there's some uh, recent uh, media uh, reports about trending down statewide, and, and uh, Madam District Attorney will speak about that in Middlesex County in a few moments, but we're not seeing a trending down in Massachusetts, in, in Arlington, I'm sorry. And we remain uh, laser focused on on addressing this at the, at the intervention phase. You know, there's prevention, which our Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition is, has, um, you know, done pre prescription take back. We have the disposal uh, kiosk in the lobby of the police station to take prescription drugs back. We did a Narcan event uh, at the Senior Center, which uh, the DA was at uh, last April, and uh, they're doing extraordinary work in the prevention area. Uh, then there's intervention. Uh, followed up by recovery and treatment. And we're, we're focusing, really laser focused at this stage, uh, in Arlington anyways, on, on that intervention um, uh, phase. And um, with that, I'd like to publicly announce that through the um, extraordinary work of our town manager and our unions uh, coming, to, coming to the bargaining table, we've come to an agreement on police officers uh, being trained in and carrying Narcan. So we'll be uh, beginning that program on uh, July 1st. Um, uh, District Attorney Ryan and her staff have trained our uh, trainers, provided us with all of the Narcan at no cost uh, to the department, and have been extraordinary in their support at uh, rolling out this program as well as other intervention measures, which I'll talk about after the DA speaks. But if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to invite Madam District Attorney Ryan to discuss the Narcan program that she's empowered us to implement, um, and, uh, and I'll follow up with a little bit more on the intervention. Madam DA. Thank you. I think if there is a good news piece to this, it is that what Arlington is seeing is reflected across the county. I'm distributing some maps that are updated as of last Friday that will give you a sense of what's happening. We have 54 cities and towns in Middlesex County, as of Friday, we had had fatal overdoses, and usually more than one, in 44 of those cities and towns. And you will see as you look at them, they are some that you might expect and many that you will not. They also, in many cases, tend to track where there are major highways, because that's another issue we're seeing, people coming off the highway. And I think the first piece to be thinking about is, if you ask the question of why is this happening, there's probably three good answers. And the first, and I use this example of myself, is that certainly when I was the age of the people who suffered fatal overdoses this week, 21, early 20s, I don't think I knew a lot of people who had had such major surgery that they'd been placed on an opiate prescription. I have two young 20 children myself, and that is not the case at all. Virtually every one of their friends has had a shoulder repaired, a knee replaced, wisdom teeth taken out and gotten an opiate prescription. So we know for a number of people that's where this begins. So looking at that piece, we've tried to attack that source. One of which is we have brought to Middlesex County a training for the prescribers, the scope of pain. We partnered with BU Medical School. We've trained people who are writing prescriptions on what are the real questions to be asking about that. And that takes, when you ask Mr. Chairman about what are things people can be doing, it takes the form of some unusual public-private partnerships that I've been engaged in. For instance, is one is with realtors. Because we know that one source, and I won't ask you to raise hands, but I would guess that a number of people in this room tonight have a few unused opiates in their medicine cabinet. You, got, you had some kind of an infection, surgery, root canal, you didn't finish them, they're in the back. Well, we've discovered that a lot of people go out on Sunday, they're at an open house, they spend a lot of time in the bathroom and they're rifling through the medicine cabinet. Mm. So you come home, you've forgotten they're there. You don't, you're never gonna miss those. So they're disappearing. Another source is in Middlesex County, we are extraordinarily fortunate, and Arlington ranks high in this category. The population age, as we all know, is trending up. 
In Middlesex County, the number of people, and don't be frightened, but anybody over the age of 60 is considered a senior in Massachusetts. The number of people over the age of 60 being able to age in place in their own home is 5% higher in Middlesex County than it is across the state. That's a great thing because people are staying in their own communities. What we also know is that they, most people, by the time they get progressively older, are on a number of prescriptions. So they've got opiates, probably, that they are taking for some condition. What we frequently see happening is the elderly person either it goes off to live somewhere else or succumbs to one of their illnesses. And left behind is very often, literally, a shoebox full of prescriptions many of them opiates. So if you've got young people who are experimenting, that's an easy source. Again, if you've got people coming into the house, no one's missing that grandma or grandpa's pills are now missing out of the box. So we partnered with some of the real estate agencies to be thinking about telling people that when they're showing their house. It's a simple thing, makes a big difference in cutting down what's out there. It also drives home the point, which is what many of us have forgotten, is that these opiates, I've been a DA for a long time. I see the amount of time and money we are putting into this problem. We aren't seeing a real decline in these numbers. And in part, that speaks to the physical nature of this addiction, to which it's important to remember that these opiates were chemically developed to be end-of-life pain. They were never intended to be used by people who would be living long enough to develop that addiction. So that piece, that really strong physical component, has to be a part of every decision we're making. The second reason why there are so many overdoses is the, just the pure amount of substance that's out there and how cheap it is. When I started in the DA's office, a bag of heroin was about $50 a bag. You can now get it for 4 to $6 a bag. So it's cheaper than a package of cigarettes. It's cheaper than a six-pack. So people very often beginning on those prescriptions can't afford those anymore. It's very easy to substitute for heroin. And the third is that what we're often seeing is heroin that's been cut with lots of other things, particularly things like fentanyl. So you have someone who even is an experienced user buying and using what they're typically using and dying from that because what they're getting is literally many hundreds of times stronger. So in going to the source and prohibiting the source of those legal prescriptions, we filed legislation. And you know, one thing that really is demonstrated here tonight is how fortunate Arlington is to have the kind of partners that I'm lucky to have, like Chief Ryan and Representative Garbley, who really have helped us to tackle this. We have a piece of legislation that we hope people will be urging their representatives to support, which would limit the amount of opiates that you can get in an emergency room to a 72-hour supply. So you take a bad fall on Friday night, you go to the, you break bone, you go to the emergency room, we want you to be able to get opiates, you don't need 90 days worth because we're finding those at the overdose sites. You get 72 hours, you go to your primary care doctor, you can get whatever it is that you need. And what we're eventually hoping to do is that those will come in some kind of a zip pack like you get for some kind of strep throat or something. So all you're getting is literally what you're gonna be able to take, not even the script. If we can reduce the number of scripts that are out there, that's a good thing. So that's targeting the legal piece. We funded, and the chief mentioned, with some of our drug forfeiture money, those drug take back boxes that are in the police station. So if you have legal drugs that you got, you're done with those, you don't know what to do with them, you don't wanna flush them, you bring them in 24 seven, drop them off. This Wednesday, I'll be paying for all of our 54 cities and towns to dispose of legally. We've hired the company to do the disposal. We expect to have thousands of pounds of drugs that we will just be getting rid of that came in in those boxes. So that's one piece. The second piece is that education piece. We're out all the time. I was up at the high school giving, again, drug forfeiture money to fund the substance-free nights collect connected to the proms and graduation. So we're getting that message out. We're doing the legislative piece, that one piece of legislation I mentioned, two others, one being with respect to one of the new synthetic drugs, NBOM, that's being targeted particularly at very young kids. It's a dollar a hit. We have let, that is not presently illegal in Massachusetts. And we've also filed a piece of legislation in those very narrow categories where we can show a direct connection between distribution of heroin and death. We'd be able to charge that crime. So those three pieces are pending. 
The other piece that's important to think about is just what the chief and I are really the ones who can do that, and that is the enforcement piece. We are really targeting our enforcement efforts at the people who are not users but are businessmen. You know, one of the things that we have seen a downward trend in is some of the gang activity that we would see across Massachusetts. That's not necessarily because they've reformed. It's because be they've become entrepreneurs, and they are engaged in the systematic movement of a lot of product. So they are very busy moving drugs, making a lot of money, profiting off this misery. So we are working very hard with our partner departments to make those big arrests, to be taking numbers of pounds of things. We, took, we did an arrest in the last few months where we took 6,000 opiate pills off the street. The other piece that's important in what our office is doing looking at this is we see these numbers. And to give you that sense, you can see on the chart 2012, for all of Middlesex County, we had 65 deaths. That went up to 80 in 2013, 146 in 2014. As of today, and we are not yet at July 1st, we've had 106. So if that trend continues, we're going to be at a significantly higher number. And remember, that's the <coughs> fatal overdoses, not counting the vast number of people who are being saved with the drugs like Narcan. So the first responders are doing a great job in keeping those numbers down, and they're still way ahead. But the second piece that we need to be looking at is, this is a problem that's going to be with us for, for a good five to seven years if, we start, if we're looking at what we need to be addressing. And that carries with it three important components that we're going to be talking about. The first is, we are increasingly seeing fatal overdoses occurring in the presence of children often you know, young elementary school age children. When you look at the trauma they're suffering, the genetic predisposition that is established for drug use, the fact that they've probably seen drug use normalized in many ways, and what does that mean for them going to school? So we are gonna really have to start focusing on those children. The second piece is, Middlesex County has now more drug courts than any other county in the state. We now have six drug courts up and running. They do a great job. The rate of success is very high. No program is perfect, but it's well up into the 90th percentile. What we're looking at now is a lower level of drug court, trying to set that model in place so we'll be able to catch people sooner in their addiction <coughs> and do that treatment piece. And the third, and this is where we're going to need the help of the community, is Right now, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts literally could not afford all the, if everybody who had an addiction came forward and said, please help me, please put me into treatment, we, we just couldn't afford that. And as we know from our legislative partners, there's a lots of bids for that money. We really need to be thinking about more public-private partnerships that will help fund some coordinated long-term treatment. Part of treatment is relapsing, we know that. Research shows you five or six relapses to get to the end of successful treatment. We have to be figuring out a way to pay for that. And, and thinking about the fact that we are already paying for it in the quality of life crimes that we're seeing take place. So that's kind of an overview of both the short-term and the long-term approach that we're taking at the district attorney's office. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam DA. And, and you know, I thought that macro level perspective was important for uh, the board and our policymakers. You know, uh, you might ask, you know, so what are we doing at the local level? Well, um, I was briefed on a recent uh, uh, heroin distribution arrest that we had. You may have seen it publicized. And after being briefed on it, uh, we asked the investigators, well, what are we doing with the names of the addicts that we're buying from this dealer? We know who they are. Uh, what are we doing? And the answer was nothing. We're, we're waiting for them to find a new dealer and then maybe turn up and be uh, a victim of one of these overdoses. So, um, uh, you know, while I respect what's going on up in Gloucester, and, and the Gloucester Chief's a good friend of mine, he and I have had a lot of conversations, I think their program has a certain uh, element of reactivity to it. They're waiting for people to come to the police station. We're going to turn that on its head. Following a criminal investigation, uh, the criminal investigators will be required to give uh, our staff, including Rebecca Wolf, our in-house uh, uh, clinician, uh, who will team up with uh, organizations such as Wicked Sober and, and others to start doing some outreach uh, with these folks, bringing them in, providing them with resources, hopefully bringing them in with a loved one so that we can um, dispense, uh, do some training on some Narcan and dispense some Narcan 
to a family member or loved one of that addict so that as uh, the DA said, when they do relapse, if they should become victim of an, over, uh, an overdose, that a family member who's nearby can deliver the, the Narcan and save a life. That's one thing we're doing. We're doing that um, with the Suburban Middlesex County Drug Task Force, which I think you have a brief memo on. It's a group of eight cities and towns that collaborate, um, you know, Arlington, Belmont, Watertown, Waltham. And so our investigators all team up and um, pursuant to the completion of any of their investigations which impact the region, we'll be reaching out and getting proactive about uh, providing services to, uh, to those addicts. Um, in addition to that, uh, locally, not regionally, um, the Arlington Police Department in concert with the uh, Arlington Health and Human Services, which, you know, under Christine and, and Jim Feeney, we have a great partnership, uh, and Rebecca Wolf, our clinician, will be setting up on Tuesday evenings at the uh, High Rock Church. Uh, they've provided the space to us um, where we're gonna uh, um, put out via social media and, and um, public service announcements. They will have people there to, uh, to do, uh, provide some expert um, uh, resources and, and instruction on support resources, resources and strategies for those who have a loved one uh, or family member who's suffering from addiction and um, that'll be Tuesday evenings, and we'll also have somebody available to do Narcan training and to dispense Narcan um, um, uh, at those meetings as well. And lastly, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, you ask a great question, what can you do? Um, I think as a community, and as I, I look at all the people here tonight, and I uh, look at the work that Rep Garbley and our legislative delegation has done um, at trying to address some of the legislative issues. I know last year they passed the 15-day uh, minimum um, uh, inpatient f uh, for the insurance companies having to provide at, le at a minimum of 15 days. And there's a lot of work being done. Um, you know, as you can see, Middlesex County DA is ahead of the curve statewide. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done there. But what we need from uh, the honorable board and the members of the community is to set aside the stigma. You know, th this image of, of a heroin addict that you may have or I may have from our experiences is no longer. This is the, the white picket fence. It's hit our community. It, if it hasn't impacted you or, or a friend, it, it will, likely will. And set aside the stigma. And if, if you or any member of the community watching or anybody here tonight think that um, uh, you're, you're aware of a person who's in need of some resources and that we can help with, contact us. Our priority is saving lives. Yes, we're a law enforcement agency, and we take that responsibility seriously, and we will investigate and work with the DA's office to prosecute those that, that choose to make a business out of selling these drugs. But we're also about community policing and, and, and working with members of the community to get the resources that, that their friend or loved one may need to save their life. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, again, I apologize for coming with such a a distasteful subject, but it is a real issue in the community. I thought it was important for the board to know that we're being proactive, probably more, more proactive in other counties and other cities or towns uh, in the Commonwealth, um, and we're open to suggestions and, and open to your help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So a few questions. Or yes, sir. I, I have a couple, I don't know, but the board might, other members might as well. So, you know, I've had three surgeries in the past few years, and I bet you the first thing I'm doing when I go home is I'm going through my, my uh, cabinet and I'm throwing that, and I, because I didn't, I'm, I'm sure I didn't finish. Uh, right, and we have a kiosk, we have a kiosk in the lobby of the police station. A lot of times, uh, as the DA mentioned, uh, we see people coming in with large quantities. It's after the uh, uh, family member has, has yeah. uh, succumbed to their illness. Yeah, encourage everybody in Arlington um, uh, to do that. At Narcan, how available is that? Is it in great supply, short supply? Yeah, so uh, it, uh, the Narcan uh, provided to the police department is provided by uh, the Middlesex County District Attorney's Office. Um, we also have the ability uh, to train, and uh, as I understand it, the police can dispense Narcan um, pursuant to our medical director's uh, prescription that, um, is either through the uh, uh, fire department, community safety, or the DA's office has a countywide uh, medical. What, Marion, what is it? Uh, standing order. Standing order from a medical director. Um, 
Uh, Health and Human Services, Christine and Jim Feeney will be working with pharmacies um, and, and you know, making sure that it is available. Uh, but we're going to be encouraging people to come out Tuesday nights uh, to High Rock Church um, and to get the training, and it will be dispensed by the police at that point, and we'll buy that through asset forfeiture funds, so uh, basically using drug money, seized from drug dealers to provide nasal Narcan to, uh, to families. Um, and Jim Feeney's working with the uh, medical doctors and um, DMDs in town on the prescription piece. And this is my naivete, but um, District Attorney Ryan mentioned <clears throat> they're uh, very close to highways. Is there a link to homeless living under bridges or something? Or it's usually, it's usually people coming in, um, making you know, doing a meet at some place right off the highway. And, yeah. and what we're frequently seeing is the addiction is so strong that the addict buying it doesn't take it home. They're going right into the public restroom at the McDonald's or the Dunkin' Donuts and, and using it right there. That has become much, and, and because they, may, they don't know what they're buying, we're seeing a lot of fatal overdoses in those settings. So if you look, for instance, even on the northern part of the, the county up by Pepperell and those places, those are places where there's highways going up to Vermont <clears throat> and where things are coming through. So those meets are being arranged. No, thank you. Colleagues, yeah, Ms. Mahan. Um, Excellent presentation on a very sad, tragic um, subject that we're all dealing with. <clears throat> and I don't know anybody up here that hasn't been personally affected by that. And um, hearts go out to all the families. And unfortunately, we're seeing it more and more. Um, just wanted to highlight one thing and make a suggestion or two. Um, I definitely agree about uh, opiate use in young children. Um, my daughter, Rebecca, I've always advocated. I told her, gave birth three times, twice naturally. The middle one, they convinced me with the epidural, hated it. But I also cautioned her. I remember leaving the hospital, push, pushing the Percocets, just because I was afraid with my crazy personality. But she uh, had a compound fracture when she was 13. The bones came through her arm, and, you know, they were pushing it in the hospital. When she left, nope, she took Tylenol. And I didn't, you know, I said, you know, if you want to take one or two, she did it. Same thing, she had a wisdom teeth out, terrible pain, took the Tylenol, had two, like, soft pockets, I think it's called. And when she went back in, the orthodontist tried to give her Vicodin, and she said no. She just wanted to know what was wrong. Um, I think that's a good message to get out. I try to get that out to my players and their, um, from my cheerleading team, and their parents, because you do see a lot of surgeries, especially with cheerleading and other high-impact sports. And I do caution them on that, because some of the, uh, my friends, unfortunately, who have gone through this personally, that's where the root of it started. It was a surgery. It was something, you know, and they got Percocet, Oxycontin, Vicodin, all this stuff. But the second thing I'd put in, just as a suggestion, um, I know myself as a coach, um, I think, I know I have to get certified every year, and it, whether it's MIAA, MSSSAA, or the National, NFHS, National, National Federation of High Schools, for coaches, we have to sit similar to as we do for selectmen. You watch a video on hazing and bullying, and there's alcohol and substance abuse, but there's really, you know, I think some of the presentation that was made here tonight, um, even if it could just go out Middlesex League, you know, through the, um, you know, uh, athletic directors, um, and I'm not saying the other coaches don't also aspire to this or, or do it, but I think it's a really good message to reinforce, like when I have to get recertified, I, you know, that's another video I'd like to see, um, to, to say, you know, this is a thing, and if you have a player that's going in, you know, what it is we can say to parents, or do we ask the athletic director? I have just done it on my own, just my, but I think that's a perfect audience, and especially the parents, because um, you want to, when your kids go in, you know, the first thing is like, yeah, make all the pain go away. Yep. And so to try to get that mindset, not that I wanted my daughter to suffer, and she didn't, you know, she's a tough little cookie. But I think, you know, maybe if you can get in with the coaches somehow. Yeah, I mean, our SRO could do an educational piece uh, via the athletic director and, yeah. you know, maybe more wide through Maya. Maybe we could. We I could would love that, that because, great of, suggestion. you know, I'm not saying, you know, the 12 different areas we get trained on. I mean, my thing is if I can take the test and I can get the 89 questions all right right away, but this is something I wouldn't mind watching over and over again to be reminded. Yeah, you know, Mike, Mike Duggan right here in town is a perfect example of, of a kid who went through that struggle. Uh, right. was a great athlete and had an injury, and he, it's a, an amazing story. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing young man. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Mr. Dunn? I just want to thank you all for coming in. It's been very educational, and I think it's stuff that we can carry out of the room as well. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Joe, did you? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your um, presentations and your work on, on this. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this. This, this Just a week or two ago, we lost um, one of our premier local, you know, um, <clears throat> treatment resources when right turn, yeah, right turn. Mo moved out. And it's a good thing for Watertown. I know that they're going to be able to expand and provide more service, but it's certainly not as convenient for Arlington residents. So I'm wondering, you know, we, thankfully we have Wicked Sober uh, as a resource, but how is the department and your, um, you know, your social work staff looking to kind of fill that void as you're yeah. making ref referrals? Well, it's a great question. The, the governor's strategy, um, <clears throat> which you may or may not have read in the media the past week on, uh, on the opiate crisis, uh, includes funding for, I think Rep Gobley said, 100 additional beds, which is, um, you know, it's a great strategy, has uh, very forward thinking, maybe a little discouraging ter in terms of the number of beds, but we see our role as filling those beds uh, when the governor makes those uh, additional beds available. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, Rebecca Wolf and, um, and Duggan has a great uh, history at placing people who uh, want to get placed, you know, not only in the Commonwealth, but throughout uh, Eastern uh, United States. So we're tapping into him as a local resource to help us get people placed that, that uh, wouldn't otherwise be placed. Thank you. I just have one more um, question. Um, I work professionally for the Massachusetts Medical Society, and I know that they've done a lot of work on prescriber and, and patient education, um, and I don't speak for them. I want to make that clear. Um, I was just wondering, you know, in addition to the legislative efforts, what types of um, outreach has there been to the healthcare community around this? Madam DA? <clears throat> I think that's an important point. We have centered our task forces in the hospitals to get that outreach going. And I'm proud to say, really, this, is, this year we've made a lot of progress with Mass Medical and some of the other associations in coming to the table on that ER emergency room yeah. limit. Um, I think everybody sees the crisis we're in now. And we really have been able to do that. BU has been helping us to provide that scope mm -hmm. of pain training. So I think that they're, the one silver lining to all of this, I think, is, as the problem has become so big, as everybody has been impacted, as the chief says, as it's now your next door neighbor, it's somebody you know, that has been very helpful. That has facilitated a lot of that cooperation. Thank you. You know, it's interesting that you have, you know, the chief law enforcement county, uh, officer for the county and the chief law enforcement officer for the community here talking about public health and, and I mean, we've talked very little about law enforcement. And I think it's, mm. it's abundantly clear, and I'm, you know, I'm repeating uh, the governor and many others, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. And, and it's, it requires uh, uh, a community-wide collaborative, and that's part of the reason why we're here talking to the board. We, we know that uh, of, of your value in the community and your con constituency can, that can help us keep this momentum going. And, you know, it, it'll be difficult to measure the absence of a death, but I, I'm convinced that if we all work together and and paddle this canoe in the same direction, we will save lives. Thank you. Mr. Byrne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so first, of course, thank everyone for being here tonight. And um, you know, it's hard, you know, you're looking at this map and, you know, friends and, you know, neighbors are, they're red dots and, um, you know, yellow dots. And, and I do think that what, um, you know, the chief was talking about in the teamwork that um, we're moving forward with, you know, on the state, regional, and, um, but also with the other departments and towns. And I do think that's um, gonna go a long way to um, make sure that we get less thoughts and stars moving forward. Um, I, I do have one question, Chief. And you know, when, when we're talking about uh, in your memo, with, you know, historically law enforcement has done you know, very little with the identity of known users. How do we get to that point? Well, you know, drug task forces become so focused on on their work and their mission. And these, these drug investigations are time consuming, complex, um, and very difficult uh, investigations. And so uh, these investigators, uh, and of course, the DA's office wants it on a silver platter when it's done, so we just hand it over so they can <laughs> prosecute the case. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and we get in our silo, right? And so we've been in our law enforcement silo for too long. and, and 
And it's, it's so, it was obvious to us after this last case that, you know, we, we've got this list of names. Well, you know, why, why are we contacting them? And they can, you know, two-thirds of them won't talk to us. Um, but that one-third that will listen to us and have a conversation that we can get some resources to and maybe make some inroads with them. And also, because we know that recovery, there are all these relapses, get Narcan in, in, into their home or, you know, with their... Uh, a cohabitator, a roommate, or a sibling, or mother or father, and, and maybe save a life that way. Thank you. Uh, but you know, we've been the, the, the frank answer, uh, Mr. Byrne, is we've been in our in our silo. We need to get out of our silo. Mm. And I appreciate your efforts in doing so. Thank, Thank you, sir. All these efforts, just one less dot on this map. Mm. That's well, worth it would be huge. I mean, you, you think about it, the families affected by all those dots. I mean, it's just devastating. I know uh, I want to thank Rep Gobley for being here tonight as well. I mean, it's, as you can see, this is, we're taking this matter very seriously. We talk about this daily, um, and we're committed uh, to doing what we can to save lives. And we want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And let's continue to work together on this. Did you want to say a couple words, Chuck? Sure, sure. Thanks so much for Thank you, Chief Ryan. Uh, the first that I, I will make note is Arlington, we're very fortunate to have our DA, Marion Ryan, our police chief, Fred Ryan, because they're at the State House on a weekly basis, not just educating Arlington's delegation, but state representatives, senators, and the administration across the Commonwealth. I think that's important, and I think that's a resource that we can use specifically here in Arlington. And the delegation takes this matter very, very seriously. As Selectman Byrd mentioned, these are our friends, these are our neighbors, our sons and daughters. This is an issue that we take very, very seriously. So the delegation looks forward to working with uh, the members of the board to really address these issues in Arlington and get some of uh, DA Ryan's legislation passed and also parts of Governor Baker's uh, task force recommendations passed. Um, I'm gonna send that information separately to the board so they know what those recommendations entail. But they work, Selectwoman Mahan mentioned education sports teams across the state, specifically across Middlesex County. His recommendations specifically overhaul education around these issues. I think I saw a statistic the other day that stated, you know, 70% of those who start, start under the age of 17. So if you start in high school, we're losing a clear majority of the young people that we need to target in terms of education. So we really need to get focused even less than 11 years old, 10 years old. We need to start earlier. So that's part of the recommendation. Another piece of the recommendation, Select uh, Min Curo mentioned uh, the issue of, of, of data sharing. And one major piece of uh, the legislation I know or the recommendations is the issue of data uh, sharing among uh, government entities and pharmaceutical companies and making sure uh, that uh, that is tracked. Another issue that Selectman Greeley uh, mentioned uh, was Narcan. And one of the specific pieces of Governor Baker's uh, task force recommendations, which would need legislative approval, is the issue of bulk purchasing of Narcan. Obviously, there's a, a financial component of that, but it's really about putting the tools uh, in the hands of our communities and making sure that we can address uh, this issue. Another part of the last final part of Governor Baker's recommendations, and there are many, is the issue of streamlining support services for uh, treatment. So currently there are many state agencies, as you know, and many of them collaborate on the issue of supporting those um, who need treatment, who need state services, but there's not one entity to support the travel of addiction services. In, his, uh, in, the, uh, in the plan is to have a central point person within the Health and Human Services who can be in charge of helping with service delivery. And I think that is very important. And in the task force, we had a number of people in the healthcare uh, industry, uh, leaders in, in uh, Mara Healy, our Attorney General, uh, and uh, Mary Lou Sutters from the administration, who's our Secretary of Health and Human Services. So um, we'll talk more about this, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Garberly. Thank you, Chief Ryan. Thank you, District Attorney Ryan. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to be with us tonight. Let's continue to work together on this. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, and speaking of busy public officials, I'm going to take the next item out of order. Item number 17, uh, we want water and sewer rates. Uh, we have Mr. Rademacher with us tonight. Uh, Excuse me. Our director of uh, public works, and I want uh, Michael has other meetings that he's been at and going to, et cetera. So uh, item 17, water and sewer rates. Thank you. Sir. Uh, members of the board. Um, folks over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to speak here on a few issues um, concerning uh, water and sewer. Uh, three, uh, in particular, uh, water rates, uh, the changing of uh, water meters, and um, and uh, a potential for that we were going to be looking for seasonal uh, billing for sewer to make up for irrigation meters. Uh, I'll start with the um, water rates. Uh, at this time, based on a couple of factors, we don't believe we'll need a rate increase for FY16. Uh, that's based on uh, two, two uh, major items. One being that uh, efforts for water um, main repair and sewer main repair to lower our assessment from MWRA has been paying off over the past few years, so our assessment uh, from the MWRA is essentially flat from previous years. We're up about 1% where the uh, MWRA is averaging 3.5% for community-wide. Uh, so that's good news. Um, and secondly, we seem to have seen, we saw a, a, a bump in sales greater than we expected in FY15. Um, could be it was a dry summer last year or the economy could be getting better. Uh, but we uh, exceeded our projections. So the fact that we are going to have a little less on the expense side and we had a little bit more on the revenue side, uh, we, we feel strongly that a rate increase is not necessary for FY16. Um, so that's one thing that you know, we look for the board to vote on at the end of this. Uh, second is um, the uh, sewer fee that we were going to look to enact or shouldn't call it the sewer fee, the, the methodology by which we were going to bill for water in the summer. Uh, about a year ago, this time, we spoke about the potential for a seasonal rate where we would uh, review a consumer's winter water usage and assume that their uh, sewer would be the same as that in the winter and then would stay the same in the summer. So we were going to try to l work our billing system to, uh, to perform that calculation. Since that time, uh, I've learned that, the, that we're going to be looking at a, a new billing system town-wide. Uh, currently, it's a fairly homegrown system we have now, and reprogramming it to do that calculation was becoming rather involved. So that being said, rather than to spend the time and effort try to reprogram what we currently have, uh, the thought is as we look for a new system, we might find a, a, a pre-programmed system off the shelf that can do that for us, but understanding that even still that might be a tall order. I think in the year that we'll be looking for that software, we can also be on a parallel track, be looking at if that doesn't seem to be the course we want to pursue, what second meters uh, would mean for the community and how we would roll that out. So on a parallel track as looking for the new software, and at the same time uh, could be examining how second meters could be implemented if we don't think the software out there available to the community would be able to make that happen. Uh, so I would present that too for discussion tonight. And uh, third, I just wanted to um, let the board know that we are beginning within the next few weeks our meter replacement town-wide. Uh, uh, about a year or at the previous town meeting we received funding to do so. Uh, we were actively looking to get a outside vendor to do this work. It's going to be fairly complicated and we had appropriated $2 million to do this. But in discussions with the Water and Sewer Department within Public Works, we feel we can do it. It might take a little longer, but it will see a savings of about $750,000 if we did the work with our own staff, maybe over the course of two years as opposed to one and a half or, or one. Uh, it seems that it's worth the extra the length of project to save that amount of money. Uh, and it'll give us an, it'll also give us the ability to have a more familiarity with our system if we're getting inside of everyone's home to replace these meters. It gives us a good educational experience to do so. And it also gives us the opportunity to comply with a DEP uh, consent order that they 
DEP is looking for Arlington as well as other communities to uh, enter people's homes and look for sump pumps that uh, may be discharging into the sewer system. And this is for reasons that when sump pumps discharge into the sewer system, that's flow that that sewer system was never uh, intended to handle. And during a really wet spring or heavy rainfall can cause uh, sewer backups and overflows. So a rolling together the meter replacement program with an inspection for sump pumps, uh, we think we can get a little bit more bang for our buck in that regard. So that's um, something else if we had questions I'd like to discuss tonight as well. But that's a program we look to kick off in a few weeks. Any questions on the board? Mr. Byrne. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, you guys are pretty busy. Yeah, a little bit. Right now. Um, um, so obviously good news with the no uh, rate increase. I, I'm curious, um, is there a time frame for the new billing system? Um, How is that project going to Well, I, I'm not directly involved. I will be for this component. Oh, Fadim. So our, our goal right now is to have an RFP drafted and issued probably within the next several months for a new receivables package. Uh, we've been meeting with the treasurer, uh, uh, the IT department, uh, folks in the town manager's office to try to, 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 bring this, to bring it forward. Our goal would be to have a selection for a vendor or vendors that we want to move forward with probably sometime by next spring so that we'd be able to have a contract sign and start talking about implementation for actually an FY17. And that's what ties in with Mike's timeline by the point that the board would be asked to make a decision next year on whether or not that we would be able to do seasonal billing or move forward with the second water meter policy. We'll have a much clearer sense of what the receivables package that we're going to go with would be capable of in terms of a seasonal billing uh, approach. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. Diane? Um, <clears throat> I have a question and <clears throat> better keep the rates flat because my husband would be thrilled with that. I don't want to be taking that one back. That's one of the bills he consistently complains about. And I want to thank you for all your work on that. Um, I just have a question and I understand we're sort of being guided by the um, ACO issued by the DEP mm -hmm. um, to the latter piece that you spoke about. Sure. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot of work involved in that in terms of manpower, woman power, as well as um, working with what is identified. And I guess I wanted to ask, a, not I guess, I do want to ask a question about the last piece, which may not be defined yet, because I know th that um, you'll probably encounter some situations where it's just a lot of stuff being hit at the homeowner or the, even the uh, commercial developer. Uh, there's language about a waiver process. Beyond anything else that's in there, like I can see someone saying, well, you know, who could apply for the waiver? Mm -hmm. Is it written? Is it online? Is it a department? Has that been defined yet? Or It, it hasn't. Uh, so the waiver, so I'll explain a little more. As we get into the system where we're looking for sump pumps, uh, if we identify one that's connected to a sewer, there are a few different ways that can be addressed. It can be disconnected and maybe discharged to a backyard if that doesn't cause other problems elsewhere. Uh, it can be put into a dry well uh, if there's room on a property for that, or it can be um, connected to the town's drain system. Mm -hmm. uh, all those have different levels of expense, the first option being the least expensive to the tying into the town's drainage, the most expensive. Sometimes there is no town drainage. Uh, and, and the expense for bringing that up, which the town would share that cost, mm -hmm. uh, may be great, or even getting to the town's drainage might be great. So we're going to have to develop or come to terms with some uh, cost that is just too, too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the DP understands that as well, and, and we can get waivers if, if the system is going to cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. They may allow you to keep it um, connected to the sewer. They may need to still be a small fee for that because that is water that needs to be treated by the MWRA. Mm -hmm. But they'll, we're going to have to take a look to see where that um, tipping point is as to where it doesn't make sense to pay to disconnect it. And just sort of a follow-up, because I'm thinking of two areas of Arlington East in the basis of Winchester water flowing down. Um, do you anticipate that the town will have any role, all the role, or s something else in terms of the process with the waiver process, or is that something that, that um, individual homeowners or whomever, whomever will have to deal with DP because of the ACO? Oh, I, I, that would deal, the would deal with us. Area, okay, because so. that, yeah. that's, it's better when you have you know, somebody that's aware of the topography and everything that's going on. And I, I'm envisioning you know, 
but I know we're going to work right. um, cooperatively with everybody, not try to price Correct. them out. You know, I'm thinking of people floodplain zone, the flood insurance that went up, and everything else that's going on. Thank you. It will be about a two-year process before we get to the point where we. Okay. Uh, where so we'll get more information yes. on that waiver. Correct. Or whatever the other questions yeah. are. Thank you. Mr. Uh, <coughs> at least three questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, that the I hadn't understood uh, so much about the waiver, so that was really very interesting, because I think I'm sure you've heard about the, like my street, of course, is one of the ones that right. has this challenge and uh, like some of the people up the hill it like looks like a six figure payment to fix that and so right. the, it would be inter if they can actually connect you know for a lesser fee to the with a waiver that would be a really interesting solution for some of the people yes. on my street yep. so i'm very interested in in hearing more <laughs> about that one i might have a neighbor who starts speaking to me again who knows <laughs> um, I guess one of the things about those inspections, I'm curious, what are the experience, have you had other towns that have, like, you've looked at, um, because I imagine going into, you know, saying you're going, going into somebody's basement looking for something that's, you know, essentially illegal, right. that's not going to be comfortable, what's, what's, what have you learned? Well, we've actually done it in a section of town already. There was a certain um, uh, area where the DEP was more concerned, about well, most concerned about it was the Kimball Road mm -hmm. area where we have... Uh, when it's heavy rains, we get a lot of water down to the Wifebrook Parkway there. Uh, and so we got into about uh, 1,000 homes last spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was fairly su successful. Uh, we had a good rate of um, uh, folks letting us, giving us access. And, and we found, uh, I'd say of the homes, we found maybe 60 connections. I think often folks don't know mm -hmm. it's not um, illegal. Okay. Uh, and... Um, and, and some maybe, you know, not maybe know that that's not the right thing. Uh, but you get a, you, you get a, we got a fairly good success rate. Okay. Of, uh, cool. Entry. Yeah. I did have one in my house when I moved in and I didn't know it was illegal, but getting elected teaches you some things. Um, for, back to the very first topic of uh, talking about the, uh, sorry, the second one, talking about uh, the seasonal versus the second meter. Yes. Uh, I definitely prefer the seasonal for all of the obvious conservation reasons, mm -hmm. but the other thing is, is that I do feel very strongly that I, f I feel like I've, um, both as a board and personally made commitments to people that we we're going to solve this in a fair way, one way or another, and uh, it, it's disappointing to me that we're going to have to wait another year mm -hmm. before we provide that solution, so I just, I feel, I mean, some, sometimes things, things happen, but I just want to acknowledge that uh, we're we're changing a commitment, and uh, and I don't I don't like doing that. Yeah, understood. Okay. I agree. I agree. Uh, last question is: uh, Could you tell me about the like? So, how have we been doing in terms of water losses and stuff like that? Because when we looked at this number three years ago or whatever, it was really it seemed to me really high. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, about three years. So unaccounted for water. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, unaccounted for water is water that uh, is we're not metering it somehow uh, it's not going into a home or a, a school where we're metering it or a, um, or irrigation whatnot mm -hmm. so we obviously buy water from wra and then we we sell it uh, and the difference is unaccounted for about three years ago we were at 30 some odd percent it, it, it's it's crazy uh we're closer to about 24 percent right now We've since, since about two, about three or four years ago, we started performing a, a very comprehensive leak survey townwide annually, where actually we hire a consultant and they, they put listening devices on the pipes and they can hear a certain frequency is, is a leak. And, uh, and that's required by law uh, by, um, uh, once every other year, but we're doing it every year because of that unaccounted for number. That being said, we have not found a smoking gun doing that. Uh, we, we've, there's leaks, obviously, we find them and we correct them and it helps. It, it, it's been knocking it down, but I, I believe there, there, are other fun, there are other things out there causing this. It could be the old meters that we're about to replace. Mm -hmm. As they get older, they don't register uh, accurately, so uh, water is slipping by those meters and that's unaccounted for because it's not getting picked up by the meter. There still may be some accounts out there that are unmetered that you know that we yet to find that we're we're still looking for as we get into houses. Another reason why I would like to do this process ourselves would we'll be more intimate with our system, and we may find some of those uh, locations that aren't metered. Uh, 
But so, so doing this meter program is going to check off a big box as to is that That's the problem. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm hopeful after that we can then redirect our efforts elsewhere if that doesn't take a big chunk out of it. Thank you. Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rademacher. Um, piggybacking on, on, on Dan's second comment around the seasonal usage, I mean, it, it, it looks like we're kind of rolling the dice and, and hoping that the billing system next year will be able to accommodate the seasonal usage, assuming we're not lucky in that, in that sense. Is there an efficiency to be gained um, by moving forward with a second meter policy at the same time that you're doing water meter replacements so that you're not accessing properties twice? We wouldn't be accessing the property for second meters. That would, uh, of all the communities that allow second meters, it's uh, uh, up to the homeowner to hire a plumber to plumb the system, okay. and then they would call us to put in a meter after that. So they would be reaching out, the resident would be reaching out to us to get us in the home. We wouldn't be trying to get into the basement. So I don't believe there would be uh, no an efficiency, efficiency there. Okay. No. Uh, I am hopeful that there, I've seen billing software that has this, it's a checkbox, do you want to do seasonal? And, and okay. th the question is, is it going to, are those systems going to meet the needs of other departments so that we can buy that? So the, the, the trick is going to be finding one that can do everything. And that's the concern. If, if we can't find that, then we would, we would have to reconsider the second meters. Great. Thank you. Well said. So yeah. do, do you need a motion from us tonight, Michael? For the rates, I believe. Just for the rates, not the other I two recommendations. I heard for the board to take a public vote that they're not raising rates for a <laughs> second consecutive year. We would love to. <laughs> not such a motion. Move approval. Is there a second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Is there any pathetic soul that wishes <laughs> not to keep the rates <laughs> unraised? Uh, any, so anything else, Adam, that you feel we need to do tonight? Uh, I, I'll further, uh, you know, for, for my part, express my, uh, my regret that we weren't able to come with a solution for FY16 for seasonal billing. Um, I think we, we went into it with the best intentions and we made the commitments that we made last year uh, with the knowledge we had at that time, again, with the best intentions, but I do regret that we weren't able to offer that solution tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Next item, um, Board of Youth Services, and I see that she is here with us tonight. Dr. Brigham, Rob Lynn, would you come on up to the microphone, please? Thank you for your willingness to serve. It's my pleasure. Thank you for putting up with my brother as a neighbor for all of these <laughs> also years. my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Uh, pull that. Pull that mic down a little bit for the millions watching at home. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in serving on the board. Roblin, sure. please. Sure. So my name's Roblin Brigham, and I've been here in Arlington for 16 years, living next to one of the Greeleys. And through that experience, I learned um, how important community involvement is watching this family be so involved and other neighbors as well that I finally met a point in my life and my career that I can give back. So I've worked for the past couple decades, a little longer, in um, youth development and I'm a researcher and I do data analysis and write reports that help show whether or not programs make a difference for kids. So I'd love to take that and be able to offer that to Arlington as well on the volunteer basis. I also am a mother. I have two beautiful girls one of whom's a high schooler, and listening to um, the mm. presenters today made wanting to do this job all the more close to my heart because I think it's so important to youth in our community to offer them opportunities and also support, and I think I can help um, with my expertise to do that. And finally, I am um, kind of a crazy advocate for fitness and wellness, so I started a program here in Arlington called Fit Girls for fourth and fifth grade girls, um, which I love. And what I learned through that program was how um, a little bit of power and a little bit of energy and a little bit of can-do spirit in this community can really move mountains. Um, so there's not a lot of communities I think I'd actually offer up some volunteer time, but I think Arlington is a place that I'd like to spend more time and give back to a little bit more. So that's me. Thank you, Robin. Sorry you haven't seen me up at the Y more frequently. I know, I've been missing you. I was wondering about that. I get to watch Kevin in the pool with the older ladies while I'm running on a treadmill. <laughs> Water Zumba, yes, yes. yes. It's a sight. And I'm good at it. <laughs> uh, questions, comments? 
Mr. Dunn. Uh, move approval. Thank you very much. The, the reasons you gave are exactly the reasons that motivate so many people, and you expressed them really well. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Second. Diane. And I, I'm really I'm thrilled that you were here to hear the presentation oh, me too. at the beginning part of the evening because it hits a lot of bells as a professional physician, a mom. Um, I'm really I'm impressed by your Arlington Fit Girls because it's not just, it's, I understand, it, physical fitness, it's also academic, running and reading, I think it it's was. It's running, reading, self-esteem, female friendship, and girl power. All and, wrapped up in one. <laughs> and that's, that's a perfect age for when the girls start to transition out of elementary and get to those really scary years where the, the, the build on confidence or they unfortunately start to lack some self-esteem. Um, and I'd certainly be interested as we move forward with the presentation by Chief Ryan and District Attorney Ryan, you and the rest of um, the board commission, um, you know, whatever active role, any assistance that we all can give. Um, and just working in partnership on that because it's Absolutely. a very important issue. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, all set on the motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Curo. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, Roblin. Thank you. Take care. Uh, appointments to the Arlington Historic District Commission, uh, Margaret Capodano. Margaret. Um, Okay, we, so um, I'll accept a move approval, but we'll ask that she come to another meeting so that we can meet her. So moved. So second. moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And at-large members who do not necessarily have to uh, speak tonight unless I'd like to Marshall Auden, Stuart Lipp, and Carol T. Are any of them here with us this evening? Okay. Well, would you like to come up and be grilled? Huh? Yeah, no, well, it, the three line. of you singing something, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, just a quick, give it, why don't you give us your name and a sentence on uh, why you'd like to serve on the Historic District Commission. Stuart yeah. was here briefly. Huh? Um, I'm an, I've been an architect for almost 40 years, recently retired. Uh, a large portion of my work was uh, renovations and additions, to, and a large part of that was historic structures. One of the things that I feel is very important in these districts is a balance between historic preservation and the issues we deal with today. Materials availability, historically labor was cheap, now labor is very expensive. So what I'm basically here to do is to find a way to find a balance between all of these issues. That's awesome. Awesome. And is that I guess that's as simple as I can put it. Thank you, Mr. Arden. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Further discussion, questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So how about, uh, Carol, you want to come up next? Uh, I'm Carol T. I've lived in Arlington for about 32 years. Um, my husband and I raised our children here. Um, and I've just had a long interest in history and architecture and preservation and living in an historic house, I'm aware of how it, this kind of thing cuts both ways because one needs to have certain rules and regulations to maintain these communities and yet on the other hand, it's very expensive for homeowners and creates a lot of conflict in that way in terms of what they feel capable of doing. Um, so I've, I've attended a couple of meetings and certainly am very much interested in continuing with that. My work history is more in the area of mental health, um, depression prevention. So I, I too really enjoy the earlier presentation. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second? Second. Discussion, questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, thank you, Carol T. Thank you. And Stuart, what? No, oh, I just Nice. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Stuart Lip, um, and relatively new to Arlington. Been here for three years. Uh, young family, two little ones. We live over on Newport Street, and um, now that we're here, and uh, we got in the town, and I don't think we're going anywhere for a while. Um, just kind of wanted to uh, 
joined a committee, uh, a commission where you know I can I can use my strengths. My background is furniture making, furniture restoration, piano making, piano restoration. I'm not in that now. I work in architectural sales, uh, specifically windows, um, but. Um, Old houses, old furniture, old cars is kind of kind of uh, what my interests are, and uh, uh, just to piggyback on what Marshall said, we were talking about it earlier. Um, you know, maintaining the historical integrity of houses and structures are really important, um, but also being a realist. And uh, um, it's 2015. And there's a lot of other materials, a lot of other costs involved today, and um, kind of want to help the commission live in those both worlds. Okay. Thank you. Do you do any piano repair in your basement or anything? I know you said that's not your business these days, but. For the right price. <laughs> <laughs> well, for that, I move that we double his salary <laughs> as a historic district commissioner. Um, um, uh, is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Yeah. Yep. Question? I, just a brief, so you said uh, historical furniture. I'm curious, have you been to the Old Schwan Bill? No, I am not. You, t you really need to. You have okay. to. Yeah. You, it'll okay. I mean, I've driven by it many times, but. Check it out for a tour. You'll, okay. I, th I, give, I mean, given that history, I think you will be fascinated. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, thank you to all three of you, and I especially appreciate <laughs> hearing your, all three of your points on balance. Uh, but we're very proud of our history in this town, so thanks for helping us preserve it. Uh, licenses and permits, a request for a change of manager, not your average Joes. Good evening. Hi. Hi. David? David Chambers. David Chambers. Um, you're the new manager? Is yes, that sir, it? I am. Okay, a little bit on your background, David, if you would. I've been please. in the business since I was 16 years old, so there's a few years there. <laughs> Now that I'm 21, I've got at least five. <laughs> uh, I've been a general manager of several restaurants in the community. I've held licenses in other communities, such as Watertown, Randolph, Burlington. Um, came on board in Saugus back in 2001 for a couple of years, and here I am. With so, Not Your Average Joe's? Uh, I was with Not Your Average Joe's from 2003 to 2007, and then I felt I had to stretch a little bit and went to work for a, another small company in the area. You might have heard of them called Legal Seafoods. Yeah, I was with them for several years, and um, it's, a, it's a passion of mine. Uh, I spend a lot of time wondering what I give to the community, and um, I give a lot to the, to the younger kids that are experiencing some of these things they're going through now with a little direction, a little motivation, a little structure, and a, a few bucks uh, when they always need it and don't have to hit their parents up maybe quite as much. But um, I've been fortunate. Um, it's, it's always paid to listen and and try to be part of the community. We're doing a lot with the community right now through our programs. I really like being in Arlington. and I've been here for about three months now. So uh, we're currently supporting the Arlington Youth Counseling Center as one of our monthly causes. In fact, they had such a turnout from supporters this past month that uh, we're doing July for them as well. So we're real excited about that. But all things considered, I'm, I'm very responsible and it, it's really important to me to be responsible. So, um, so far so good. Thanks, we're, we're glad to have you here. Is there a motion? Mr. Dunn. Actually, I'm going to start with the question. Of, uh, so I just, it was fairly important for me to see you and have you come in to, uh, tonight because I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that Not Your Average Joe's had an alcohol violation serving an underage last year. Yes, I am aware of that. Okay, can you tell me about how it's been going with the, with the uh, programs and the t forums and all that stuff? Well, it's, it's um, pretty much everybody's carded period end of story uh, unless you're 100 percent certain that you know it can't possibly be less than 21. Um, we teach it from the very beginning we talk about it on a daily basis we talk about it one-on-one -on -one, talk about it in groups and also as a corporation we have several classes that we take people through serve safe alcohol as well so it's, it's a focus it's it's been a problem um, for a lot of different companies in a lot of different areas um, we're, we're very, very focused on that. It's important. It really is. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Mahan. Just sort of a follow-up to that. Um, I also shared that. Yeah. Um, having you come in. Um, and you weren't here at the time in Arlington when the violations occurred. No, but, I was not. But um, when they did occur, uh, you know, several gentlemen from corporate came in and they had, you know, a really voluminous, well-put-together um, policy and protocol 
of um, how they would um, react to um, suffering the violation serving underage. And one of the things they cited was, you know, they set out policies and protocols, and they s stated that there would be weekly um, designated times where, um, whether it's the shift manager or the general manager, mm -hmm. would set aside. Is, is, is that done a certain day? Is that done a certain it's, time so it overlaps on, on a shift? Or you yeah, just... it's a, we do what's called a pre-shift on a daily basis, twice a day actually once prior to the lunch service and once prior to the dinner service. Mm -hmm. And it's a constant topic of discussion, um, especially with the new people. And we're bringing a lot of new people on board right now, and it's really important. Um, I, I kind of one of those people that looks for personality mm -hmm. and people, people versus the seasoned server to take care of the guests because those are the people that really connect and really make a difference. So they're a little bit more spongy, if you will. They soak it up a little bit more than some of the people that have been doing it a long, long time and set or the, et cetera in their ways. So uh, we talk about it, like I say, extensively um, in training and we talk about it weekly as well in the meetings. And, and it's important. We've got to stay on it. And, and you might want to just check with someone from that, that corporate office that came out, because I know they also referenced that in going through this process and presenting all their policies and procedures that Absolutely. one of the ones that kind of fell to the wayside was making sure that after every employee who is serving alcohol is uh, appropriately trained, that they had a form where they sat down and they had bulleted seven or eight points where the employee has said, yes, I have been trained on this, yes, I am aware of it, and they sign it and date it. Absolutely. So if you could just follow up on that, I will. as part of the um, penalty, um, and I think I was going the other way to you know, go a little bit harder, yes. was that uh, the gentleman from corporate came in and presented you know, probably Beautiful. 150, 200 pages and rep made all these representations. Okay. So I just want to make sure you're aware of Yeah, that. absolutely. And, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll go back to the store and I'll reach out to the training department and the people awesome. that were involved with that, and I'll make sure I go through every single file. And if there is not one there, there will be. Okay. I'd like to move approval. Second. Second. Further discussion? That aside, great restaurant. Best of luck. <laughs> Thank to you very you. much. Hope all to see you all soon. All those in favor, soon. please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, David. Thank Good you. luck. Nice meeting you. Thank you. A request for Class Two license, Arlington Auto Brokers. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Hi. So, tell us a little bit about your request. Uh, we are requesting a Class Two license to sell and resell used vehicles at uh, 1211 Mass Ave. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I do have another location in New Hampshire. Okay. And I see the location here and it's close to my house, Stoneham, so I'd rather be here. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> We'd rather have you here. Uh, yes, Ms. Mahan. Um, I'd like to move approval, but I do ha just have one question. It's a housekeeping question. Mm -hmm. And um, through the chairman, um, on, on the application, um, which starts on page five of nine um, under this agenda item, the question, and it just may be it's an archaic question, it doesn't matter, but number nine regarding the signed contract required by Section 5B, Class 1, where it says no, is is that okay, or is that something that we just have to take care of, or is that something I shouldn't pay too much attention to? It's the um, original application that stated June 1st, <coughs> 2015. It says application fee in the upper right-hand corner of 100, and then there's a series of 11 questions, and it's question number nine. But that says for class one, isn't this a class two license? Okay, so that that's where I'm making the, then we're fine. Thank you. It just, the way it was worded, it says as required. Okay, that's fine. Right. This is uh, class two? Doug, is that correct? Yes. They're applying for class two, okay. and so that, that's why this isn't necessary, correct? Okay. Yes. Other questions, comments? Okay, move approval subject to conditions as set forth. Second, please. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you. Thanks for choosing Arlington. Good luck. Uh, Carmen Victualler's license, BNB Food Corporation, uh, Donna Thai Kitchen. Hi. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Uh, my name is Bandit, Donna Phum Suk. Uh, and my partner is named Shaolit Kaiwasang. We uh, do a Thai authentic food. We have uh, 22 seats and 11 table. 
and we're gonna do a Thai uh, the real original we would like to uh, Arlington resident know uh, what is the real Thai kitchen what is the real Thai food mm-hmm. and uh, we uh, didn't sell the anchor home because we think about it opposite us is a uh, Arlington High School yeah it's gonna be better if we don't sell uh, anchor home yes and, uh, any question? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from the ward? Yeah, Mr. Dunn. Uh, move approval subject to all conditions. One question. When do you think you're going to open? Uh, in the uh, 12th, in next month. <clears throat> July? Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Uh, samples of the food? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, example, uh, papaya salad. Do you I like it? To, I'll have to come into your restaurant to, to <laughs> test it. Uh, Dan, who moved? Dan moved Dan it? Moved right, and down, yeah. seconded by Diane. All those in favor of uh, uh, passage of this license subject to all conditions as set forth, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye all those opposed. Uh, good luck. Thanks for choosing on. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. And for another common victualers license, BNK Enterprise Inc., Olympic Pizza. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, William Goldberg representing the manager, Aisha Kumar. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, perhaps know the proprietor, present proprietor of this establishment, and he was very concerned about who he would sell the business to. As a matter of fact, the mayor of Boston was interested in it, but Tom finally only found out that he was interested in the name and nothing else. <laughs> uh, this, Aisha Kumar is, has been in the restaurant business uh, for a number of years. And uh, he uh, is, is found himself in a particular situation where there was an opportunity to come to Arlington, one of his favorite towns. And he uh, wanted to purchase this business, which is an active business, and, and the town seems to like the, the uh, menu, et cetera. Uh, so he, he made the offer and it was accepted. And we come before you tonight uh, to indicate that there's nothing that's going to change there. The structure is going to be the same. The menu is going to be the same. The hours are from 10 uh, a.m. in the morning to 11 p.m. at night, seven days a week. So that with the experience and the similarity uh, of the operation of the business, uh, it's, it's going to be successful as Tom's has been. So we're before you tonight seeking uh, approval of the issuance of the Victor license to uh, this gentleman. Excellent presentation. Uh, questions, motion? Move approval, subject Move to approval. all conditions. Subject to all conditions, second? Second. Second, questions, just, discussion? Just one. Yep. <clears throat> um, I know at the time of the application, um, you were still um, contacting the Board of Health Office, and they indicated to us that um, a plan hadn't been submitted yet. Has that been rectified, or is that in the process of getting done? We got that plan. Oh, I have the, uh, the plan. If you, I, if, I'll take it from you, uh, mm-hmm. but have you said that? The Board of Health has said. I'm going to bring it to the Board of Health tomorrow. Okay, so it'll be subject to all conditions. That was the only thing that, the last thing that needed to be checked off, but you have it. Okay, just want to make sure you're aware, Thank you which you much. are. Thank you. All those in favor, please state and fire by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you for choosing Arlington. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you very much. Thank you. Uh, citizens Open Forum, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the Open Forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three-minute time limit to present a concern or request. Anybody wish, here wishing to speak under Citizens Open Forum? Citizens Open Forum is closed. Why do I read the paragraph? Traffic rules and orders. I'm number 14, approval for a sidewalk sale on Broadway Plaza. Uh, Barbara? Yes. I'm um, here. I, you each should have, get a copy of my lovely photos and little diagram. Um, I'm here representing the Body and Brain Center on, um, it's actually on Broadway. It's down near Starbucks, in between Starbucks and CVS. Yep. And actually, they've been there about 10 years, and they wanted to have a body, uh, what we call a garage sale. 
sort of like a sidewalk sale. It's a way to raise money where um, we support a group called Earth Citizen Organization, which is a nonprofit entity of our larger establishment. And uh, the money that we raise at the garage sale or yard sale, whatever you want to call it, will stay locally. A lot of times we may create scholarships for youth to go to. We have a, um, a meditation center in Ari Sedona, Arizona. We have an organic garden. Uh, we have many programs that we would offer to youth or even plant trees in the community or whatever. So it's a way to raise money and create a, a fund for that kind of activity. So I think I, I hopefully you can understand the diagram. Mm -hmm. It has just basically six tables. Um, if you look at the bigger picture, the first picture, it shows the area out in front of the yoga studio. But in that picture, the, the brick looks short. But if you look at the smaller pictures of the next page, then you can see that the space is actually pretty large, so we would not interrupt any walkway. Um, you can see in the, the actually hand diagram that we've left certainly plenty of space for a walkway on either side and would be far enough away from the bench that people could certainly still use the bench and would just use maybe six six foot tables in that middle space between the trees. Move Question, approval. move approval. Second. Second. Questions? Discussion? You were so persuasive. <laughs> Come to the sale. You'll love it. <laughs> I was so nervous coming here. Oh, no. <laughs> we're tough. I take, a lot of deep, I take a lot of deep breaths. <laughs> this is one of the better diagrams, yeah. trust me, that we've received. Well, I, yeah. I can show you. The here. regional director said, well, now you're being a... Um, what was as I do the diagram? I said, "Well, pretty soon I'll be the attorney." Yeah. <laughs> anyways, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, Thank we you. encourage everybody to come down there on July 11th from nine to four. Come for us, Dale. Thank you, Thank Barbara. You. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, discussion. No. Oh, Ted Fields. Ted, uh, commercial vacancy and business trends report. Thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. I'm here to update you on last October's inaugural uh, commercial vacancy report. And I'm also going to enhance that uh, update with two new pieces of information, a, um, an employment trend report and a, uh, a summary of some business interviews that I've conducted to flesh out the, the vacancy statistics that can be a little bit dry. Um, Right now, Arlington has about 1.8 million square feet of commercial space that's rentable. Um, and over the past seven months from last October, when I last reported to uh, the end of May, the vacancy rate in that space has dropped from about 3.1% as we track it to about 2.3%. And we track it in a very unique way and I think the most comprehensive way possible. We look at what is listed as vacant on the CoStar MLS system. And then we go out and we chart a uh, space that's not advertised on the MLS system and see what's listed for rent there. And we get kind of a composite picture that gives us the most complete picture we think is available for what's happening in Arlington's commercial market. So overall, commercial vacancies have dropped over the past seven months uh, to 2.3%. This is very low compared to our neighbors. Uh, the only comparable communities are Belmont, which is at 2.6%, and um, Winchester, which is about 4%. Our other neighbors are much higher. Um, however, not all sectors fared equally well, as I show in my uh, documents to you. Uh, retail vacancies went up by about 6,000 square feet, uh, but those that gain was uh, offset uh, in the uh, industrial and flex markets, which went down about 19,000 square feet, and office vacancies went down about 4,000 square feet. Um, and in response to these movements, uh, retail rents came way down, about 14% over the past seven months as commercial property owners uh, stopped, sought to stop the, the rise in vacancies with lower rents. Um, and in the opposite direction, uh, office rents have gone up about 20% and uh, rents for industrial and flex space have gone up about 11%. Uh, 
right now, uh, in contrast to seven months ago, the average office rent is very close to the average retail rent. It was, that was not the case seven months ago. Uh, another factor. So, Ted, oh, me, so it's retail. Say that again. Office rents are now equaling retail because retail has office has come down, or or retail has gone up. Uh, you're right in terms of the <coughs> vacant space. Yeah. Retail vacancies have gone up. Okay. Causing rents to go down. Okay. And office vacancies have gone down, forcing their rents up. Okay. You said it clearly. I just confused no, it. No, you have the right idea. No, thank it's, you. Uh, it's, it takes a little bit of thinking through to, to, to get it. You did well. Um, and another uh, area of analysis the board really stressed last time was turnover. And there the situation has similarly changed from seven months ago. Uh, we define turnover as the time on market in terms of months when a commercial space goes from not being used to being used. Uh, and using that definition, Arlington's average commercial turnover rate as uh, determined by CoStar <coughs> listings me. Uh, has fallen dramatically from an average of 17 months, seven months ago to six months now, as of the end of May. And it hasn't materially changed over the past month. Um, and this, six-month average is dramatically lower than all of our neighbors. So this is a much more active market than it once was seven months ago. And, and it's mainly because uh, owners of retail space have really um, scrambled to fill rising vacancies. Um, and an area where we really see this is when we track the amount of space listed on CoStar which hasn't changed a whole lot in seven months. It's gone up maybe 3,000 square feet to the amount of space not listed on coast or listed on uh, shop windows or on in newspapers. That has dramatically dropped from 30,000 square feet to 11,000 square feet. And this is showing us that property owners are becoming much more professional. They're scrambling to fill uh, vacancies and they're broadcasting their vacancies across a much larger area reached by CoStar. They're becoming regional in their advertising instead of uh, more parochial. Um, and uh, these are just broad trends. Behind these broad trends are dozens of individual decisions made by business owners. And to kind of get an idea of those um, individual decisions, uh, last year we started uh, interviewing business owners who come into Arlington as well as opt to leave Arlington or expand in Arlington. Um, and I've summarized 10 of those interviews for you in your packet. Uh, and the real finding here is that uh, business owners make decisions not just on locational factors or factors that the town can control, per se. They really make decisions for a wide variety of, of reasons. Um, and we, I, this is showcased in two recent interviews that I have done that I didn't have time to summarize for you. One of them is with a very unique purveyor of goods from the Far East. Um, and that person has to shut down uh, his shop on Mass Ave because a recent natural phenomenon, an earthquake, wiped out the production capability in that country for his goods. There is no other way for him to get inventory at wow. all. And that's completely killed the business that was thriving. And that he, he wants to keep here, he can't keep here because there's no more stock for him to sell. Because the earthquake wiped it out. Wow. Uh, and conversely, uh, there is, or I shouldn't say conversely, on a, another note, there is um, a business that was very popular in town uh, that has uh, since had to close its doors. Um, and it didn't want to, but it had to close its doors mainly because it had trouble advertising. It had trouble uh, broadcasting um, its message on the internet and on, in local venues. Uh, but it really wanted to stay in Arlington. If it had been able to buy its location, it would have stayed 
in Arlington and stayed open, but renting at even a reasonable rate, it just wasn't worth the owner's perceived interest to continue on uh, scraping by or losing money after the, a very tough winter when uh, they weren't really, she didn't feel getting her met, their advertising, their branding out. Um, and you know, most of the business owners I contacted in these surveys really liked Arlington. They liked being in Arlington. They liked being in the, in the different villages that they were in, the different centers they were in. Uh, but there were other factors beyond the town's control generally that either made them leave or uh, allow them to expand or, or to come into town. So I just thought it was worthwhile um, giving you a, a, a larger, a deeper picture of what business owners are thinking as they fill these commercial spaces or, or vacate these commercial spaces. And I'm going to expand this to um, the licensing process. So whenever somebody comes in for a common victuallers license or a business certificate or other type of license, uh, I'll try to um, insert the, uh, the survey instrument. It's about five questions long to them so that I get a better idea of, of who's coming in, why they're coming in, and that should hopefully lead us to produce some better policies down the road. Excellent. And then finally, uh, you know, Arlington's economy has a number of factors and facets. Commercial space is definitely, and infrastructure is definitely one of them. There's also the people who work in those spaces. Employment is very important. Uh, employees help a lot of local businesses. They, they help keep the centers vibrant during the day. Uh, especially. So we started tracking employment in town last year and uh, felt that this year was a good year to report a trend you know from last year to this year and I'm happy to report that uh, as of the end of March the last month when we had complete data from the state uh, Arlington's uh, employment base grew 1.6% to a record level of 8,760 jobs. That's the highest we've seen since 2001. And it shows that employment-wise, we've recovered from the Great Recession and we're uh, in good shape going forward. Does that uh, include town employees? Or this it is does, it, it includes uh, public thousand. sector employees too, yes. Uh, not just from the town, but from the state agencies and whatnot. Um, the strongest job gains uh, were observed in the retail, professional, and technical service, food service, and construction sectors. Uh, and now it's important to note that these, this is employment of uh, firms located and headquartered in Arlington. So on the construction side, those are people who are employed by Arlington-based firms, but at least for construction, they generally work all over the region, not just in Arlington. That's an important distinction to note. Uh, and even more exciting employment also grew in important regional growth sectors that are small relatively in Arlington's economy but are growing quickly uh, is the information, healthcare, and arts and entertainment uh, sectors. Deep declines were noticed in the financial and insurance sectors, miscellaneous services, and wholesale sectors. And um, in terms of uh, long-term trends, manufacturing, uh, jobs continue to decline as well. That's a trend that's been observed for many years. Um, and with the, your packet, I, I provided two pie charts for you showing kind of the distribution of Arlington's um, uh, employment across sectors as well as the number of firms in each sector. And it's important to note that uh, all economies specialize to some degree. Arlington's economy is pretty broadly based, but we nevertheless, the town's economy right now specializes in educational services, healthcare services, and uh, the retail sector. Those three sectors alone account for nearly half the jobs uh, in town. When you add construction and food services to those three, you get about two-thirds of the employment in town. Um, and I go a little bit further um, uh, in my analysis. To, we really wanted to look at not just job growth, but where job growth was uh, happening in sectors that really help uh, local businesses. 
Uh, we have a number of firms that kind of have a national scope or a regional scope, and they uh, fill their um, requirements for goods and services more with national or regional suppliers. We have other businesses like artists and creative enterprises and, um, and uh, professional services that really source their um, goods and services they require locally. We want to take a look at those and I'm happy to report that uh, job growth over the last year uh, has largely been concentrated in sectors that really have strong local links like professional technical services, again, informational services, arts uh, and entertainment and retail. They had strong job growth and they uh, keep, uh, source a lot of their goods and services that they use in their industry with the local economy, local, good, local firms. And sectors uh, that experience job losses tended to be concentrated in um, areas that don't have as many uh, local suppliers like manufacturing, wholesale, transportation, and administrative services. The one exception was the uh, financial services industry. Uh, they source a lot of their uh, goods and service provision from the local economy, and they had a significant drop in, in employment. So we're hoping that that sector rebounds um, in the future. So I, uh, it's a lot to throw at you. I tried to summarize it as best I could, but I'm happy to answer questions. Questions, Mr. Curo. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you for this, Mr. Uh, Fields. Um, it's always good to have the numbers uh, in front of us because especially I, I think, you know, for most of us probably retail is most visible mm -hmm. and there's always a little, I have conflicting emotions like night like tonight we approve a couple of, you know, common victual licenses, class two. Uh, it fills me with a lot of hope when I see that um, storefronts are either going to be filled or business is going to be continued. Right. There can be some <coughs> worry though when, when you know, you see on a particular block a couple of vacancies go out and you worry that it might be a trend that'll be prolonged. So it's helpful to have these numbers. Um, one thing that kind of jumped out at me when I uh, looked at these, you, I, I like that you broke down Arlington Heights and Arlington Center and East Arlington. Right. And I noticed a, an interesting um, trend here between the five-year averages and the 2014 here to date that there's been kind of an inversion in the retail vacancies whereas East Arlington was had a, a higher vacancy rate um, over the, the five-year average um, and it you know descended it was lower in the center and then low, a little bit lower but practically the same in the heights it's right. now the opposite um, yes when we look at this where vacancy rates now down to, to one percent I read that and um, I think of some of the things that we've gone through and it seems to say that despite some of the um, doom and gloom about the impacts of the, the corridor project, there, there is actually optimism around, um, ar around the um, commercial area there. Although I, I do also note that the uh, retail rents dropped pretty uh, drastically. Um, right. I still get worried that we're, that despite an overall trend down of retail rents that were higher than all of our surrounding neighbors, uh, except for Lexington, and I right. fear that that puts us at a bit of a, of a uh, competitive disadvantage. Um, <clears throat> and I, I wanted to ask you about something that you state in your, um, in, in the report. You, you said that development usually is stimulated at a 10% vacancy rate. Correct. Okay. That, that's a, a very general rule of thumb in the development industry. Uh, it differs slightly with different sectors, but uh, across the board, uh, vacancy rates are m in Arlington right now are much lower than those thresholds, especially the 10% yeah. general level. Yeah. Um, I ask that because I, I think a lot of us have been very supportive of some of the goals in the master planning process, right. promoting uh, mixed-use development and, and more of a commercial <coughs> tax base. One of the questions, though, that's come up in some of the forums is, you know, are we al already um, are we in a position right now we have so many vacancies that we really couldn't <coughs> absorb right. more, you know, retail or commercial space? 
Um, and you know, your stats seem to refute that. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, uh, the vacancy rates definitely show that there is a market for commercial space in <coughs> Arlington. Um, it, they don't say how much extra demand there is, per se, but uh, they are significantly uh, low enough to, uh, by the general rules of thumb, induce developers to develop where there's capacity um, to develop. Um, so I, I think that's an important consideration to take into account. Uh, Arlington is a fairly small commercial market compared to larger property markets like Lexington and Cambridge and even Somerville. Uh, so the dynamics are a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, but I think especially in terms of offices, uh, as we see office rents really increasing dramatically in Cambridge, uh, there are definite possibilities there. Um, retail is very sensitive. Um, but it's important to note that these three different types of commercial property can help each other as you develop especially office space which is relatively dense in terms of employment those type of employees patronize sure. uh, services and retail and 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 dining uh, establishments during the day uh, so the retail and office can help each other out uh, especially if one type develops uh, it can spur the other to develop as well so. Great. thank you very much thank you Thank you. Uh, on the rent, looking at the graph about the rents and looking at the uh, the change in the rents that they're trying that they're, they're describing there, do you have a sense of the methodology of how those numbers are being developed and like like what's the number of transactions per month and things like that? In terms of what CoStar is generating, uh, 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 this one is from CoStar. Yes, that's it's for okay. using CoStar data. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're, they're looking at uh, lease tra lease transactions. Do you know, so do you know like how many transactions per, I'm trying to figure out like how much of this is noise and how much is it is, mm. is is signal you know if there's like one transaction a month it, you know you're learning more about the property that transacted than you are about the market uh, leasing we're talking about between all three commercial sectors probably about 30 to 40 thousand square feet a month or, or over the time yeah about if I let me remember this, 30, 30 to 50,000 square feet over the past six months. Oh, wow. So it's really a pretty small sample. Though. Yeah, it, it's fairly small. Okay. Thank you. But so one transaction can have a large effect, as you yeah. say. All right. right. Thank you. Mr. Byrne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you to my colleagues for those comments. Um, one, the, so I appreciate all of the work that's been done here, but one thing. And I, I do like the, the trends that you spoke of. But um, I'm really interested in this uh, retention survey mm -hmm. that, that you've been working sure. on. And um, so looking through the questions, it seems like they, um, you know, you provide the questions to them and they yes. can check out a box. Yes. And I, I, what I really liked were the, the stories that you were giving at the mm -hmm. beginning. And I think we can really learn quite a bit about or I think we can inform our policies quite a bit more if we have those surveys, mm -hmm. um, particularly when, when, you know, nearly all of, not, not all of them, but pretty close to them are saying, you know, business closed due to poor performance. Um, I'm dying to know, you know, what caused that uh, poor performance. So if there's any way that, you know, moving forward, and I do know this is quite a lot of work, we could kind of, you know, if I know you have some of this information, but if you could even provide it to us, I, I'd be sure. really interested in digging into it. I can provide you a fuller, uh, more detail for each of these mm -hmm. cases. I have more detail. I just summarized them here. No, and I and this is a, quite a lot of information as is, but I, sure. I think that those, you know, really being able to see mm -hmm. um, the ins and outs of each business would be pretty helpful to. I think it's important to realize that there are many small, especially small businesses that fail, mm -hmm. and and. You know, to, uh, many times entrepreneurs fail a number of times before they get a successful formula. So it's not uh, unusual to see a business inhabit a space and then fall out of the space. No, of it. course, but I, I, and I understand that completely, but I mm -hmm. think just getting into, you know, um, you know, I just, I think more information would be helpful than sure. business closing due to poor performance and sure. they reopen. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mahan. 
Um, I do appreciate all the work that's been put in on this. <clears throat> and um, like my colleagues, I, I'd like to look at trends and tracking and things like sure. that. But I'd like to, A, have a question, sure. two questions. One's sort of, can we use COSTAR to get, get additional information? And then the second is, you know, what do we do with this to take it out to the next step? Um, then where am I coming from with this line of questioning is that a lot of people in Arlington have said, you know, how come we don't attract certain stores and certain flag companies? And the, really the only place that we can maybe have some sort of an impact, and I've driven through there as have others, is our only industrial zone up there, which when you go through there are quite a few vacancies up there, as well as I'm always surprised by the, the parking that's actually back there. So the stores that I hear from people in Arlington when they said, how come we lost this particular store, it's basically flag companies. Um, so I don't know if it's, I don't want any ex exhaustive um, search or, or time awarded to this, but is there any way, I don't want to say a forensic audit, but we could um, get, in terms of that one industrial zone, sort of a mini co-style report on that in terms of, you know, the trends, square foot vacancies. Do you know I, what I'm I talking can, about? I can examine, I can drill down to that level. Is, is that Coastal. not a lot of work? I don't, I'm not trying to. I can do that, Can you yes. check with the town manager and if, sure. he, if he thinks it's, Okay, and then um, that's a prelude to my next question, which mm -hmm. is, is this something, all this tracking and trending data, um, which is good to know, mm -hmm. um, but is this something you foresee, not just you, Ted Fields, but also the planning department, in going forward um, in terms of trying to solicit businesses, especially around the industrial zone, as well as well-known places that are vacant, so that, you know, I know it's not our job. It's up to the uh, owners mm -hmm. of the commercial spaces. It's, it's to their benefit to get it um, rented and have money coming in, coming out. But just in terms of people in Arlington who are, are saying, you know, trying to get back a big, at least one big flag company back in here, do you anticipate that, besides having this data, that that will help you? Or is it that not something that really is on the plate? No, we are using this data to help us identify uh, the relationship between the commercial pro what's available in Arlington right now in commercial property and how that inventory matches up with growth sectors uh, in the regional economy. Uh, for example, uh, one growth sector we're looking at is um, information services, technical services, professional services, especially around uh, collaborative workspaces, uh, co-working spaces, how does our commercial inventory match up with the needs of that growth sector uh, where a lot of Arlington residents work? And it, it could provide a great <coughs> service if we have those type of establishments in town serving local residents, uh, providing them an option instead of commuting out of town, staying in town, patronizing local businesses. So we are using it for that analysis, for example. That's just one area where we're looking at. We could certainly use this data to look at um, the fit of the town's commercial property with other mm -hmm. types of um, establishments. Mm -hmm. and so, sure. And I, and I want to thank, I didn't know if you wanted to. I, I would only add, I think this data will help as years go forward, uh, making proposals to town meeting for implementation as part of the master plan. So when certain zoning changes come forward, having data like this that will be able to back up what we suggest. You know, a, a lot of times when you talk about zoning, it's a we could do this or this may happen. I think a lot of the data that uh, Ted has been gathering and then sharing will help make those arguments stronger at time. And, and I do appreciate this is a lot of work and this is a good baseline to have sure. for, for that um, scenario, <coughs> as well as for you know what we're trying to do for economic right. planning. Um, and and so I don't want to minimize all the work that you've done <laughs> no, and no. Every, everybody else. Um, I, I do truly appreciate it. I can see the hundreds of hours that went into this. Um, I was just trying to take it. What, right. Actually, you're already taking it two steps forward. So. Excellent. Forget about my one step forward. Thank you. Anybody want to move receipt? So moved. Uh, seconded? Second. Uh, excellent detailed report, Ted. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And sorry we're holding all of you up later into the evening here, but uh, Next, uh, we want to uh, talk about endorsement of our bike facility design guide. Wayne. Good evening. Uh, 
I'm Wayne Chenard, your town engineer. I haven't been here in, since you hired me four years ago. So wow. I've been having a blast. Sorry we kept you here so long tonight, Wayne. Sorry. Another My pleasure. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, to, I'm sorry? I just, just lower that mic just a touch. They, millions at home, Wayne, millions. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to listen tonight. What I'd like to develop for you is the process or the path that we, do, we took to get to this process. Uh, th I think it was about three years ago we had finished paving Mystic Street uh, down by the, the golf course. And uh, at the time, we would start our projects, put them back together the way we finished them. And if you have a newly paved street, uh, we put a center line down the center and put uh, parking lines down the side and we moved on to the next project. We got a little feedback, excuse me, a, uh, a little feedback from the, the bicycle community uh, saying we missed an opportunity there uh, to develop the, the, the biking capabilities on Mystic Street. So from that moment, we developed a, a working group with the Transportation Advisory Committee, DPW, TAC Committee, and then the, uh, the Bicycle Advisory Committee and we developed some guidelines that the DPW could use uh, to review each street as we're developing our, our capital project each year. And we didn't want to be able to miss an opportunity to, to have a network of, of lanes and bicycle sharing facilities. So, so we developed a, a, a pretty much a recipe to follow uh, based on width of streets, parking availability, speed limit, traffic volumes, truck usage, things like that. And it's a little more detailed than, than, than that, but we use that information to develop the best way to, de to, to, to plan bicycle uh, facilities. And, and this is the result of that. Uh, we've done it, uh, probably tweaked it for about two years now. And before we got into the new capital projects for the year, we wanted to present it to you. Uh, hopefully that you could endorse it and ask any questions about it. Uh, and more importantly, there's on page six, there is, there's a network map. So we don't want the whole town to have bike lanes and share roads. We're looking for connectivity through town, in and around town, uh, for major corridors and things like that. So you'll see that Mass Ave, Pleasant Street, Lake Street, uh, Lowell Street, different, different connectors that will get you uh, to different uh, avenues, different destinations. And we developed this over over you know two years of working group meetings so if uh, if you have any questions I'd like to, to answer them if I could otherwise before we start painting the roads we we didn't want to surprise you <laughs> it's not going to happen that frequently you'll see there's just a select few uh, roads and and only will they be put in when we get to the point of of resurfacing them so we're not going to dig them up just for a bike lane when we get there and then we start resurfacing, improving the infrastructure. We can provide these accommodations and it will actually work nicely with a new, a new policy from MassDOT, which is the Complete Streets Program. So we're already on board. We have a policy that is, is practically, uh, I believe it's in progress, not completely accepted yet because MassDOT hasn't approved their, uh, their guidelines yet, but, but we're this far behind them. So we'll be available to look at complete street projects. Thank you. Wayne, would you remind me what's happening in East Arlington as this project is finishing up? Are we doing share lanes or? Uh, there are bike lanes on the, on the, the full the bike the lane, end. both sides? Both sides. Okay. Uh, questions from the board? Mr. Byrne? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Greeley. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Byrne. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't you mention it again, either. <laughs> um, so so I, I'll, I'll start by moving approval, and thank you very much for all of your work on this and uh, to all the other groups. And what, what I think is really important, not only that we're going to line ourselves up to, to get more money from the state, but that this is, um, it's codified now and that we're not gonna be surprised um, as projects move forward. And um, you know, not only um, will the engineering department and DPW, but all the residents will now have an idea of what, what will be expected when these projects come up. And I think that that type of information just goes such a long way to um, avoid confusion, confusion as the projects um, you know, come up. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Dunn. I think you put together a really good group to work on this, and I think it's a really good work product. I, I like. Uh, I think it's a great plan. Well, I, I might as well acknowledge them. Uh, we had uh, Scott Smith from the. Oh, he was actually a, a 
you got uh, two different committees. He wears a hat for the TAC committee <coughs> and for the ABAC. Uh, Phil Goff from uh, the Bicycle Advisory Committee and Howard Muse from the TAC. And we, we you met numerous times over the years. And uh, it was actually done about a year ago. It just, we just tweaked it, kept getting it a little bit better. So the last year was just making it right. Thank you. Mr. Hero. Thank you. Um, thank you for the work. I, I especially uh, like these forms that you have to just objectively assess the situation, follow the decision tree, total them, and, and uh, objectively make decisions about what should happen um, on the road. I was curious what the box means, uh, ideal total. Though I see you have subtotals based on, on um, the yes, no answers to this series of questions about the Page road number. conditions. But there's an ideal total. It is uh, six of ten. Sorry. Six of ten. It's the second part of the form. His is numbered differently because we have yeah. the memo. Oh. <clears throat> so tell him what's the at the top of the page. Draft contact sensitive bike lane design guide. It's the check boxes and it has um, mm -hmm. yes and no and, and, oh. and the boxes and subtotals. But there's a box at the bottom right which says ideal oh, total ideal total oh, I and see. i was wondering how that's arrived at oh well we all know the world is in the ideal world so <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these things uh, are, are are tools for us uh we will we will use some uh, decision making uh with based on uh, professional judgment as well uh, but ideal total i'd be honest with you I don't. I can't. Can't recall what that was for. Okay, Scott. I, I know. I was going to say Scott. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, no sweat. No sweat. Maybe we should just remove that box. <laughs> Maybe we should. Because I. Oh, well, what was that anyway? Mm -hmm. Scott Smith, Tack, and ABAC. Uh, <coughs> I think this will be a very indirect answer. One thing we found is that this is more challenging to apply than it looks, mainly because road widths vary all over the place. So your ideal total, and then you get the practical concern, well, the road is this wide here and then that wide a few feet further up. And then you have to look at it and say, okay, let's do what's reasonable here. So I think this total really is an ideal. You know, it's just not applying the formula. Then you have to actually look at the street and how the width varies. Okay. That was a good Thank shot you. at it. That's good. Come up with it. Uh, for, for the, the perfect example is this first first road section that that we that kicked us off on this, which was Mystic Street. There are places where it's 52 feet, and there's places where it's 38 feet. Yeah. That's a significant difference. Sure. If, if something is only for 200 feet, you don't go thro throwing in a bike lane for 200 feet. You, you want to have some consistency, so you're developing, uh, you know, a feel through the corridor. Uh, it, it may have to do with that, and I will. We will have a follow-up meeting just to discuss where that probably came from two years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mahon. Just one question, and, and just because our, our, we're sort of our pages are paginated differently from what you say. Um, okay. Um, so I just want to make sure when you said on your page six, the proposed routes were depicted outlined is that the page which isn't number but it says it has a map it says the proposed. only one that looks like a map correct yeah. is there any way because i've tried to widescreen it and open it up um is there any way and not a, a comprehensive list but we could get um street list, street list of i believe what the that purple. is on there as well i can uh i mean is it in this document and i'm not finding it yes where where is that i'm sorry i apologize oh, that's okay Oh, you can get back to me on it. I don't want to waste your time. Oh, I know you've been tonight. sitting here all night. You guys don't want to go home, do you? Huh? Do you, do you know me? Have you met me, sir? <laughs> it's night, not so. Monday Night Football, so I'm not in that much. <laughs> uh, under the uh, draft roadway restrapping guide to providing bicycle facilities under street, it would be, I'm going to just show it to you. Yes. This one here? Yeah. The street list is right at my finger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's page five of our it's okay. PDF, and right in the middle of the page. We're, okay. we're going to tweak this a little bit with your permission and hope you'll still support it and actually put page numbers on every document. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I missed that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, so it was um, Mr. moved by Mr. Burns, seconded by 
Mrs. Mahan, further thoughts, questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye all those aye. opposed. Thanks. Again, sorry to keep you here. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. We're here for a while yet, too. But uh, have a good evening. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, all right. We dealt with 17 already. and 18, we're going to go into an executive session for at the end of the meeting. So 19. Approval of suspension of meters in the municipal lots. Mr. Byrne. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this is stemming from our ongoing meetings with the Parking Implementation and Governance Committee. And um, I, I know this has been a long time coming, but for, for a myriad of reasons, particularly um, one, they, they do generate quite a bit of revenue for the town. Um, we, we've, you know, I think the board has voted to keep them online. Um, but I think we've passed the point of no return. And um, we, I just learned this um, this past week in a meeting. Um, in that it's really not worth it to have a private vendor come out and continue to fix these. Um, the, the plan right now is to have the new meters installed by the end of August. And uh, in the past, um, you know, historically, uh, revenues generated from the lots dip during the summer anyway. And, and it's really um, just not worth it. It's not worth the headache of having these meters still um, still in place. So, so I do ask that you'll um, support me in um, voting to suspend these um, until our new meters um, come online. Um, I will note, um, we do ask that people still obey the three hour limit. Um, so we do have some sort of turnover um, in those lots still. And two, if um, you, I know this issue of the farmer's market parking passes, um, I think that we should also um, offer to have those redeemed for anyone who wants to contact the town and get their, I believe, $10 back. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to do that for you, so. Second. Discussion? All those in, oh, oh, sorry. One question, um, are we going to, and if the answer is no, I, I totally understand. I'm just, we're suspending that, but will we still be going out and tracking and anyone who parks more than the three hours would be issued a ticket, or are we suspending ticketing also? No, we do ask after three hours that, um, you know, you move your car in that. Um, they'll still be, you know, using the truck. Okay. And just if someone says, oh, you said it was suspended and I got a ticket, I'm going to be able to say, but that was the plan from the beginning. Yep. You were on your honor system that you were going to do it, but we still have another way. Yeah, and, yeah, well, our parking <coughs> offices are going to be. Well, yeah, I just want to. be, uh, um, you know, business as usual. Yep. Okay, thank you. Doug? Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify, we're voting to suspend the meters and to redeem anyone who affirmatively comes to the town seeking their money back from the farmer's market permit? Yes, and uh, you know, I wish that there was a more effective way of doing so, but we, we gave out quite a few tickets, and I do ask that people will come and get it, but uh, I think it will be quite a lot of work to track now, it. Am I right? We're talking just the Russell Common Lab, or all meters throughout the town? I, all meters. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm still with you. Thank you. Mr. Kerr. Um, I just had a question. And we know that we're going to be replacing them at the end of the end of the summer. Does it make sense to set in motion the wheels of actually removing the, these meters during the summer? Because I only asked the question because I think we've all had the experience of going down there after hours and the meters aren't in effect. Oh, so we're going to have people all wandering. We're going to have bags still. over them. We'll um, yeah, and I guess the so the infrastructure that you know is currently keeping them in place is going to be reused. It so is. we're going to um, okay. leave it leave it as be and just put bags over for now. Okay. So if I may, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, uh, uh, there's a little bit of half and half. Some of the pads are just going to be enhanced, and some will be relocated. But so it'll be a bag slash eventual removal yeah. combo. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So as long as it's crystal clear to anybody coming. Yeah. In, yeah. This is. Still happy down that end? I'm, I'm holding on. He's <laughs> chilling like a villain. Uh, on the motion by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Ms. Mahan. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you very much. Mr. Chapdelaine, Intermunicipal inter Agreement with Winchester Veteran Services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I've mentioned this to the board, I believe, um, in new business recently, and this has been a topic we've been discussing uh, with some of our neighboring communities for several years, and that's 
sharing uh, veteran service uh, staff uh, amongst multiple communities. Initial discussions had been between Arlington, Belmont, and Winchester. Uh, I think there still would be the potential long term for such a, a broader collaboration. Uh, but right now, uh, through conversations between myself and the Winchester town manager, as well as Jeff Chunglo, Arlington's veterans agent, uh, and Health and Human Services um, uh, Director, Christine Bongiorno, uh, along with uh, Winchester's veteran staff, uh, we have uh, put together basically a six-month pilot that would kick off on July 1st and expire on December 31st with a built-in um, check-in time on December 1st to see how it's working for all parties. Um, the Division of Vet uh, Department of Veteran Services on the state level has signed off on this pilot program uh, in terms of uh, recognizing it temporarily as a district. Uh, the next part of that would be the Board of Selectmen of both Arlington and then Winchester approving this intermunicipal agreement, uh, which basically codifies uh, both the services being provided and our ability to charge Winchester for the services that we provide through our veteran service officer. Uh, th this, I think, um, you know, th this helps us, um, you know, utilizing a resource we have and receiving financial benefit from Winchester, and it certainly helps Winchester in um, making good in the eyes of the uh, state's Department of Veteran Services in terms of offering the level of veteran support and veteran services that the state requires um, and, and can start to um, try to enforce on a community. So what I would ask for the board's uh, consideration tonight is approving this agreement in principle. The Winchester Board of Selectmen also has to approve it. Uh, so would there you know, be some slight changes? I would ask that you authorize uh, me to sign uh, the agreement in principle just to be able to make any administrative changes that might happen through the approval process. Uh, and then uh, I would certainly come back to the board uh, in December and let you know how that um, review process is going on and make a determination of whether or not we want to suggest that the board continue uh, with the Veterans Service District. Move so approval. Moved. Second. 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 Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, yeah, I just want to say that I'm very happy we're not um, on the side of going and searching for, you know, an agreement like this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, Jeff does a fabulous job, and um, we're, we're very lucky in Arlington to have um, such an individual dedicated to uh, these types of, you know, critical services. And, um, yeah, I'm just very happy that we're not, I guess, in Winchester's shoes currently. Yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. just want to comment on the continued creative exploration of uh, regionalization. And I am really, I love the initiative. I love what the word to endorse it. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Good work, Adam. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, future BOS meetings. So in September, the 7th is Labor Day. How about the uh, 14th and the 28th? Oh, Town Day, Town Day, sorry, yeah, go ahead. And 14th is Rosh Hashanah. The 14th is Rosh Hashanah? Well, and Town Day is what date this year? 12th. 12th, okay. So, I get the 14th. I won't be here on the 27th. <coughs> Andrew and I both will be at the ICMA conference on the 27th. That's a Sunday. That's a Sunday. Do you mean the Monday? The 28th, excuse me. Mm -hmm. First works. Everybody all right with the 21st? Yeah. So we'd just be trying to get away with just doing one in September? Is that going to work? Well, I don't see a way. I mean... How about if we leave it that if we need a second yep. meeting, we look at a Wednesday? All right. Yeah. Or, a dif or a different night that, yeah. you know what I mean? Just for the one I'm time. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I mean, we really can't. Yeah. All the other Mondays who, are out. Who would be here? You and Andrew would be away. Who would be third, Doug? Uh, yeah, I think. So you keep jumping seats, Doug. Adam's seat, your seat. Adam's seat, your seat. Oh, this is something you guys want. <laughs> All right. that, that's what, maybe we should schedule it then. Yeah, I don't know. Go for it. So then how about October 5th and 19th? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Anybody? Okay. That works for me. Okay. okay. Everybody? Uh, yep. Uh, that's not... When is uh, Columbus Day? Okay, 12. 12. 12. Okay. And I'm away that whole week, so I can't do it the 12th, anyhow. But. 
You can certainly go without me. 5th and 19th, what, honey? Oh, right. So then November. Uh, Veterans Day stays on the 11th, right? Yes. It doesn't move. Nine and 23. Works for me. Uh, sorry, one moment. When's Thanksgiving? I think the 26th. One moment with Kevin, sorry. Yeah, okay. You're going to be in Florida Thanksgiving? I'm not sure when the Veterans Day. Veterans Day does um, not stay on the alarm. Well, I hope so. What yeah, about veterans? Veterans would be Wednesday, 11 11. Oh, it does do, yeah. But that, that Monday will work for me, too. Okay, sorry. It'll work. But um, 9 and 23 were saying, but you got any opinion there? Uh, both sound good. Thank you. Okay. And December. So uh, traditionally, the 21st would be a short meeting followed by our annual get together. So you want to say 7 and 21? Okay. Yep. That should be fine. Yes. Yep. Yes. Done. Yes. Okay. It was pretty painless. Yeah. I think it's the leadership that makes it so. <laughs> Except for every year. Are you it's, finding it's, that? it's one of my kids' birthdays is a meeting. And yeah. I'm like, I don't feel justified saying, no, please let's not meet that night. Year, I, Rebecca Turk. So. Yeah, you always get that. Yeah. So uh, next, right? Okay, we're all set? Yes. Okay. All right. So next, uh, Minuteman School Building Statement, which we have on our desk here. What are we doing with this? Uh, so I'll, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'll give a, a brief introduction and suggest that Mr. Dunn uh, also make some comments with his uh, focus working on behalf of the board on this issue. Uh, so there is a, a document attached uh, tonight's agenda. The document you have before you is uh, slightly updated as suggested by Charlie Foskett, who's also been a leader on this issue for the town uh, for the board's consideration in adopting, uh, adopting this position. Uh, basically, um, we have been moving along uh, quite slowly trying to get 16 communities to <coughs> agree to the revised regional agreement that Arlington, along with nine other communities, adopted not in 2015, but back in 2014 uh, at the annual town meeting. Uh, there's still a number of communities um, who ha have not adopted, and there's some communities that are uh, continuing to be very challenging in getting them to agree to adopt a revised agreement. Uh, this is all swirling around at the same time that the school building project is beginning to advance uh, and uh, uh, an enrollment figure has been offered forward to the MSBA. The MSBA is now considering that. Uh, once the MSBA moves forward, the district would then need to come up with a funding plan uh, within, I believe, a year's time and produce that they'd be able to fund the project. Uh, Arlington, through the Board of Selectmen, and I believe town meeting for quite a number of years, have been on record that without a new revised or uh, without a new regional agreement, there would be no building project approved, regardless uh, of the enrollment or any other factors involved with that building project. Uh, so we still don't have a revised agreement. Uh, the superintendent is working on some small changes to the already agreed upon revised agreement that Arlington and those other communities agreed upon. Um, that would possibly bring uh, Wayland and Boxborough, who are two of the outliers, back into the fold. But he has simultaneously began to publicly talk about invoking a statute that would allow for a district-wide ballot initiative to support the building project. So basically a district-wide referendum to support the building. Uh, now for a number of communities, financially that's not that big of a deal because of what the financial impact would be of a building project. It's certainly a very big deal to Arlington. Um, in, in any version of a building project for Minuteman, we'd most likely want to consider pursuing a debt exclusion. This would make doing so very challenging. Um, and we also feel like it's uh, not compatible with a collaborative approach, a collaborative approach that we've been leaders in over the course of the past several years. 
So um, I believe it was just uh, two weeks ago now the superintendent first mentioned this at a Minuteman School Committee meeting. He's been talking about it privately for, for a long time, but more as, hey, this is something that's out there. Now he's asking his school committee to actually consider that. Um, I feel very strongly that's the wrong way to go at this time. I think the working group in Arlington that's been working on it, myself, Selectman Dunn, Charlie Foskett, Al Tosti, Steve DeCourcy, Sue Scheffler, Tony Lionetta, Doug, uh, have um, you know, all been working on these issues and feel as though it's, a, it's somewhat ignoring uh, the long, hard effort that we've put into this. So uh, Dan had suggested I agreed. Charlie uh, Foskett already, uh, also suggested via email to the board that the board go on record taking a strong position in, um, opposing uh, the uh, Minuteman School Committee moving forward with this ballot-wide, uh, district-wide ballot initiative. So uh, Dan suggested some uh, framework. I tried to build it out uh, into some <coughs> positions that the board could affirmatively act upon, and I also included some of the language that the board had acted upon back in 2012 as some precursors to supporting any building project. Uh, so happy to discuss with the board, make any changes they feel appropriate, but uh, if the board was to act on this, uh, we would send it uh, with a cover memorandum to the Minuteman School Committee, the superintendent, all of the member towns, the MSBA, and our legislative delegation. Uh, so the the ballot question, the, the, so putting this on the ballot is uh, would be a big deal. Uh, I really think of it like uh, it's a it's an override vote, and it's an override vote where it isn't even just Arlington that's voting; it's all the other towns that are also voting. And all the other towns could effectively put something on us that would require us to do, uh, you know, it is an override vote in a lot of ways. Uh, it's always been on the table and I've always, you know, there are people in, in, who use it to describe it as the nuclear option because I just, and I uh, frankly, I'm surprised that the superintendent is so quick to head in this direction. Uh, he, you know, he hasn't even asked anybody whether, I mean, it, Frank, I mean, he, he's, he's right that if he walked in here and he said, you know, Arlington, here's this plan, what do you guys think? I suspect that we would co come as close to unanimously no as we, as we ever would. Of course, it's up to us to say that. But I am stunned that he'd still uh, go there that quickly. And I think that we need to react uh, strongly, and I think we need to react clearly at how, uh, you know, how not okay this is. It is not okay for someone to effectively <laughs> put an override ballot that could happen as early I forget how quick it is. It's like 45 days. 45 after. days. So, you know, if they, they are going to meet next week. Yeah, next week, a week from today, July 7th. Uh, is that a week from today? Anyway, July 7th. Yes. And they could vote. And have, so there could be a referendum on our ballot in the middle of August that says, you know, let's build the school for this big. And I think that we need to be clear how unacceptable it would be to, uh, to make a vote like that. Uh, I afforded everybody over the weekend uh, what Belmont had, had proposed. They had actually, they'd gone in a different path. Uh, I'd been thinking, talking to the school committee and the superintendent, they went to the MBA, uh, MSBA and said, you know, don't fund this thing that they, they're asking for. And that was, it was intriguing. So part of the question we should talk about is who should we send, I mean, provided we agree with this statement, who should we be sending it to? And I feel like it should be the school committee, the superintendent, the other 16 town or 15 towns and our delegation and the MSBA because it's just you know you, you, this would be a, 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 a yeah I've said it enough. Second, that's a motion. <laughs> yeah, uh, and yeah, then we discuss. I guess uh, for discussion, that's a motion. Let's send it to all those people. So then, yeah, it goes to a vote and loses. Yeah, what happens? Uh, so it's an interesting. This we're in the. Why do we let that happen? I guess is what I'm asking. Because I think it would lose, but I, I'm. Yeah, uh, it, that's a good question. What would happen? Uh, the the MSBA may back out of the project and say, "Look, you guys just so aren't ready right, that on. we're just dropping this project entirely." They would have a lot of grounds to do so. At the same time, they've recognized already how difficult this district is in terms of like getting it to consensus and, and so on. And they may say, okay, get, here's another year, in which case we could have another conversation about the regional agreement. We could get to 16. We'd have some towns drop out. But frankly, I think we'd also have to come to the building committee, would have to come to a proposal with a smaller number of size because I, I still don't think that they personally, I don't think they've got the size right. And there aren't a lot of people who do think they've got the size right. 
so if you look at this, the arc of the saga over the many, many, many years that we've been invested in, most of the time I've been able to point at it and say, you know, I don't know if this is going to work, but this is going to be the path forward. If this is going to work, this is the way we can go. We're actually at a point right now where I do not see that path. Like, I don't see a way out of this without um, the state getting involved. Uh, I, th I think it was two, three years ago, Adam and I walked out of a state house meeting and we said, there's no way this is going to get solved without a crisis. And who knows, maybe this is the crisis that's actually going to get the state to, you know, take some action. But I just don't think that these 16 towns are going to be able to put together the, the recipe. Forgive me, colleagues, for jumping ahead, but I guess this would be to Doug. Doug, on the ballot, could we, I assume the wording's going to come from Minuteman, mm -hmm. could we add so that we could inform the voters what this would cost them, so we can help them decide to vote against this? Can we add to that, do you think, Dan, or Doug? I, I, I don't know if Selectman Dunn has a position of it. I don't, I don't believe that we could. Um, could we add another question? I actually don't think so. I actually think, so for a lot of things we call the ballot, this is actually called by the Minuteman School I Committee. Understand. Yeah, I don't know that we have any control. So it's going to go in the town so, so the, 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 I'm sorry. You know, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, the, the sort of reflexive things that Arlington would do aren't usually going to be ballot measures. In other words, as a reaction, we could hold a special town meeting to approve certain actions. Um, we could try to withdraw from the district. We could initiate a whole other set of things that would pursue in a more or less parallel track. But there, there wouldn't necessarily be um, a ballot question with some legal effect. Could we try to put something on the town ballot that was a non-binding referendum or question? That's a possibility that I think I'd have to explore with the so state elected. It'd be very tough to get a ballot question that could explain that to the voters. Yeah. Well, Sorry, colleagues. Joe? Yeah. Thank you. We absolutely have to do this. I, I have two questions. Number one, in this statement, is there any benefit in um, reminding uh, the recipients of this also that we, the town of Arlington, is on record supporting the Needham resolution? Because we, we reference the exit provision here, mm -hmm. but we, we're on, on record supporting the Needham Resolution and we're not standing in the way. Wouldn't we have to explain the Needham Resolution in there then? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're on record as, as, as stating that we would not, we would not oppose, um, what was it in the first year, any... any um, That's an interest, especially given that we are talking about sending this to the other 16 towns, or 15 right. towns, and Part, frankly, I'd like to partly get their attention. I think that a paragraph about that could make a lot of sense. So from a, from a practical point of view, I, I, I believe it's Boxborough's, well, I, it's both Wayland and Boxborough's major concern. They don't care about the Needham Resolution. They don't trust us. And they want one of their proposed changes is express language or explicit language in the new regional yeah. agreement vote, allowing them out. Yeah. So a simultaneous vote. You vote for the new regional agreement, you knock them out. So. Perhaps but it doesn't hurt to put a, a point in. Uh, how about the uh, how about uh, sort of covering both, which is a statement that says um, Arlington supports any town's choice to withdraw from the district. Arlington will not block any town's choice to lose the district. No, we don't want to say that. We don't. We don't. We. I don't think we want to do that unless there's a new regional agreement. Um, okay. And I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure we can. As a Board of Selectmen, we can say what our position is. That would be, okay. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. Yes, yeah, so you can say that's that the Board's position is yeah. that. Yeah. I, think that the, I think this is written from our, that voice. Yeah. Diane. But um, are you saying you want to put a statement there? The Board of Selectmen's position is that we will not block their efforts. I, I'm very hesitant on that because okay. just where this is a crisis that we're in, such a volatile issue, and everybody's basically putting all their chips on the table and it's going to ante up. Um, I don't want that to come back and sort of bite us in our block sort of okay. thing, you know? Yeah. I've, I've, yeah. Um, and, and is this in relation to Joe, Mr. Carroll's question regarding citing the town of Needham? So, okay. Right. So I, I would have the same thoughts along that yeah. same. So we, uh, uh, just, just, just to myself personally. Yeah, just to refresh people's memory, that uh, so we as a board 
agreed to what's <laughs> called the Needham resolution, which says that we as a board, we, if the new regional agreement is approved, we as a board will not seek to block anyone who leaves within the first 12 months. So we as a board adopted that position 15 months ago now or something like that. But that's, we're not even there yet because that's, that's right. if the regional agreement and so the, is approved. But Joe's question is, should we remind people that we said that? I, th I think it doesn't hurt either way. It's just how strongly yeah. everyone feels. I mean, I have no problem with that. It's the, the block thing statement right. I did. So I'd be guided by everybody else. I think we should remind them. I mean, even if Wayland and, and, and Boxborough don't go along with it, it, it highlights again, I think, how unreasonable their position is without coming out and quite saying that, right? How about if I add under number two, uh, so representatives of the BOS Finance Committee blah, 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 to approving a school building project. Um, this collaborative approach was evidenced by the Arlington Board of Selectmen's adoption of the Needham Resolution, um, you know, committing to not taking action to block withdrawal should a new regional agreement be passed, or something like that. I think that's a good way to handle it. It is evidentiary to the town's commitment to be cooperative and collaborative. Can you just put the period after adopting the town of Needham resolution? I could do that, yeah. Because, okay. again, I don't want to give them more. More ammo, yeah. I mean, if they, if they don't know what yeah. it is, they can go ask their town council, yeah. city solicitor, yeah. you know, get, what's that citation, what does it mean? Okay. That's a good way to... I'd rather have it in there inherently yeah. versus... So that was my first question. My second question was, is there any benefit to our um, also contacting the MSBA in support of uh, Belmont's uh, recent communication? So the motion I, so motion I made is that we should include, we should send this to them, so yes. Yeah, okay. And so I'm saying send this to the MSBA, send it to the school district, send it to the 15 towns, send it to our delegation. Okay. Okay. Mr. Brown? Do you have any appetite on how the other towns feel about this um, ballot question might be the only thing we're unanimous on. Really? <laughs> I would. I, I can't. I can't say that unanimously, but no, my sense is so? unanimously that I, I think it would range from uh, anger, like Arlington would have, to perhaps um, apathy. Uh, but I don't think anybody would say it's the right avenue. Yeah. Yeah. What? So. And so the, the Minuteman School Committee, there's a representative from each town. And is there not the thought that those representatives would then support what their towns are wish, you know, telling or representing to them there? Recent history has not demonstrated that pattern. Yeah. I think that one of the actual practical benefits of sending this is actually it, that those school committee members will be they'll get a different voice than just hearing the superintendent say this is a good idea mm -hmm. and so i actually think that as this i actually think that this has a practical actual effect yeah, no, I, I think this is yeah. a great idea as well and i i was just those are just i'm curious i guess you know it may i, I it, it's worth mentioning uh, mr Byrne, that though it's never manifested itself as a problem here one of the pieces of the revised regional agreement was shifting the appointing authority for the regional school committee member from the town's moderator to the board of selectmen unless the town chose to keep it as the moderator and i think that is as a result of in the number community a number of the other communities them feeling as though the moderator was not an accountable body mm -hmm. that would have some political or policy level control over that school committee member whereas the board of selectmen would be i'm happy with the letter Doug have something? Mr. Chairman, if I may, the, the only thing I wanted to add was that, uh, speaking a little bit to, I can't remember whose question was, but what Mr. Dunn was saying about what happens if the vote fails. My understanding of this, and it is a little bit murky, is that the MSBA would want to hear from, not us, but the school committee as to why it failed. And so they would then be responsible for presenting some information as to why these communities, if they don't seem to Do you to mean the Minuteman School Committee or the yeah. Arlington School Committee? No, the Minuteman School okay. Committee. So yeah. this kind of a str is, is a strange process in the sense that they control the ballot question, and then they might even control the narrative for saying why it didn't work out once the if if the vote tracked the way so, we think it might. So there is an, if I may, Mr. Chairman, there there is an interesting uh, factor at play here, where the new CEO uh, of the MSBA is the former town manager of Sudbury, a member of the Minuteman School District, oh. active at the table 
in all these discussions. Mm. Only in that there, there, there's less uh, there's less occasion to uh, perhaps trick, fool, mislead what the realities might be because mm. that woman, Marine Valenti, knows very well what the issues are of the Minuteman School District. Okay. So it was moved by Mr. Dunn. You seconded? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And thanks to all of you who were so involved with this for so long. I can't believe they're choosing that route, but. Mr. Chapter Lane, end of year interdepartmental transfers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a sort of an annual approval that I come to ask for the board, uh, board to consider. Uh, some years it's been under the consent agenda, but we saved it for last this year. Um, <laughs> Uh, the only actual action requested of the board is to approve the interdepartmental transfers, which were included amongst these transfers. However, I think since there's a, you know, really a large amount dealing with snow and ice, we decided to include the full package of both reserve fund transfers and interdepartmental transfers, just for the board's review uh, before taking, taking any action. Uh, just very quickly, the large piece of this is covering the snow and ice deficit. Uh, for FY15, uh, given the winter that we had. Uh, so you can see in uh, the cover memo uh, a breakdown of how we were covering those costs. Uh, $771,000 in the FY15 budget for snow and ice removal, $500,000 that we would plan to raise on the FY16 tax rate, already been budgeted and set aside. Uh, $388,000 uh, tonight being requested to transfer from the group health budget. Um, also, um, and actually, I, I apologize, that would be the total that would add up with the remaining balance uh, being covered within the DPW general fund budget, so no need for a transfer in that regard. Uh, several of the other transfers are necessitated by uh, large buyouts or a large number of uh, retirement resignation buyouts, um, notably in the fire department and the comptroller's office, uh, as you can see described. Uh, and then uh, going through the rest of the departments, you can see uh, some smaller transfers dealing with a, a number of issues that um, without going into any detail, I'd be happy to answer any questions the, the board might have. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the detail. <coughs> um, just just a quick question on the, um, the snow and ice levy um, that will go on. Does that require a specific vote from, from this board or is that essentially automatic? Uh, well, when the board sets the tax rate, it would be adopting that full package that has it being raised on the tax rate. Okay. Thank you. Just done. Does this zero out the reserve fund? Brings it down to $19,941. About? About basically zero. <laughs> yeah, it might be, I might have transposed the number. Uh, thank you. I have sort of, a, I don't know if it's a pedantic question or whatever. Um, when we... It'll get back to this when you know we've started town meeting every year and we talk about the previous year, year's FY budget and we talk about how we closed the gap and took from stabilization and reserves and then it's been cited three to five hundred thousand you know savings from GIC. That gets me to my question on group health. Mm -hmm. um, the monies for group health that are in group health are as a result of is that as a result of the GIC savings. So when we initially went into the GIC, you're absolutely right, there was a large amount of savings. What we see here is every year we make a certain number of assumptions. We base the next year's budget on the plans that people are currently enrolled in, and then we make assumptions about people who will retire, and then we'll backfill those positions and people will have to go on benefits on both the town and school side. And then <clears throat> with the school uh, growth factor that's now been in the budget for the past two years, we then budget some additional positions, assuming that to meet up with that enrollment growth, there'll be more teachers hired and they might choose insurance. So we take uh, half family plans, half individual plans for that total number of new contracts, as we call it. And when you go into the new fiscal year, sometimes people change plans. Uh, sometimes we don't hire as many people as quickly uh, for the full year as we would think we would. And sometimes people don't take health insurance or we assume the 50-50 uh, individual family and the breakdown doesn't happen like that. Uh, we also choose, when we use the number, we look at the average plan, sometimes they take a cheaper plan. So there's a number of factors that roll over the course of the year that may result in funds being available at the end of the year. But what I'm saying is every year when we cite 
And what I want to know is if any of those savings are encompassed in, in the group health um, budget fund item. When we cite that GIC has saved us, every year it's been six figures. I think this year it was 237 or 327. Um, what I'm wanting to know is that GI savings, which is as a result of the employees paying more, we're taking that money and applying it to the budget. Is any of that encompassing group health? So the, every year that you set the GIC or the group health budget, whatever amount less you didn't have, you're either funding town or school budgets or it's going into the stabilization fund to then further extend the long range plan. So is that a yes and a no? I guess it, 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 it doesn't work in the way <coughs> that you're asking about. The group health doesn't carry from year to year. It's set as a budget amount. So if it's set at $15 million, and had we not been in the GIC, say it would have been at $16 million, mm -hmm. that other million is available for either spending in town school, other departments, or allowed to be able to be in the override stabilization fund. No, I'm, gonna, I'm totally fine with this. I'm going to end it here. And the only reason I ask, and I have a whole year to do it, um, is just... Hearing about those savings every year and hearing from town employees and just, I'm not saying this is, you know, um, the case point 100%, but I'm still hearing, you know, when is, are things going to roll back and I respect negotiations and all but one has been settled. So I, I, I was, I'm kind of playing in my head, uh, perhaps a warrant article question, um, but, but what I'll do is I'll have a private conversation in the future with the manager just to try to explain more what it is I'm thinking and he can tell me, it, yes, that's right, it's not and whether I move forward or not. And then if that's something I do with, it will be six, nine months down the road. So I'm not going to ask any more questions, and I'm happy to support this. Okay. Thank you. I Anybody apologize. Anybody else? Motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. Uh, correspondence received? Move receipt. Second? Second. Discussion? Just a little disappointment, they only gave us a 30-day extension, but they did mention in that letter that that's, it's unusual for them to do so, so I guess we have to say thank you that they at least gave us the 30 days. Uh, you can work with that, Mr. Chapterlin. Yeah, I actually, Mr. High wants, if the board is so uh, willing to just give a brief schedule of how we will meet that sure. uh, deadline. So Mr. Mr. Chairman, as, um, as the board will recall, we had the site visit, we contracted some uh, wetlands, uh, specialists to represent the town's interest in terms of examining the site. Um, but the lack of the full extension does present a small scheduling problem in the sense that um, <clears throat> our response is due August 10th. Uh, so what is likely in this board's best interest and myself and the town manager and other folks will be reaching out uh, to uh, the board through the chairman to discuss them. We ask this, you keep this in mind, is what likely should be done is uh, for us to schedule a special and separate hearing in the Board of Selectmen for the purpose of only, um, A, inviting the developers, Oak Tree, to come and make a presentation that will ask for as much detail as they, as we feel like they should provide, um, given the truncated schedule that we've been given. B, we'd allow uh, stakeholders and community interest groups to present their points of view to the board and be present. And also this board could invite relevant commissions, uh, boards, and uh, town staff to make some presentation or be available to answer questions from all of you, such as the planning director, folks like that. Um, I think we probably have to find an appropriate venue for it that would be bigger than this space because based on what we've seen so far, the, um, the interest in this is going to outsee the capacity of this space here. So it's something that I just ask you to keep in mind, given the fact that Mass Housing didn't give us all the time we wanted. And if you recall, we asked for that time because summer schedules, the 192-page report that they submitted, uh, I think really does all merit the time that we asked for. And I think while we're frustrated that we didn't get all that time, um, we should be trying to work within the time frame that they have allowed us as much as possible. And that way, that way if for whatever reason we can't, we could, we could seek a second extension, but I don't think we should operate with the presumption that that will be granted. Is there anything else you want to add, Mr. No, I think, I think that covers it. So do we have to call a hearing before the end of August? Is that what I'm hearing? I think that would or be the ideal 10th. situation, although August 10th is the deadline, so we could, um, you know. August 10th is the deadline? August 10th is yeah. the deadline. Oh, because the 30 days started back from when they... That's right. That's right. So uh, while in theory the board could try to sneak in uh, its position, what we want to make sure we do is 
gather what we would obtain from a hearing, the board's perspective, and generate the board's response with enough time for the board to really consider um, whether the response is what reflects this board's feeling on the eligibility um, so that you're not rushed at the very end. Should we set a date for that right now? Um, we certainly, so we certainly can. Yeah. Yeah. Given the letter, I think it's appropriate within the scope of correspondence received. So back to calendars, huh? Yeah. Would you say end of July? Well, I, I, I so I think that we can. Beginning of July? I think that we can, I think, I think that the mid to the end of July would be, would be wise. Yeah to give yourself enough time to prepare. So our July meeting is the 6th, am I right? 13th. I'm oh, sorry, 13th. Oh, I don't have it in there. All right, 13th. At least that's what I wrote down. I, <laughs> the 13th is really too. Yeah, 13th. That's right. So what, hold it on that night? No, I don't. I, no. He's no. saying a separate I, I night. A separate oh, night. I agree, a separate night. Um, so either a Wednesday or the 20th? Yeah, I'm not available on the 20th, but that doesn't mean anything. You all could go without me. How about the 22nd, Kevin? How about a Wednesday? 22nd, about the 22nd, I could do it. 22nd? Is that a Wednesday? I didn't have my calendar. It, it, is. Be, yeah. it is a Wednesday, yep. That would be fine. How does that work for everybody? That'd be good. Just so this board knows, I'm scheduled to be out on the 22nd, but we do have Attorney, uh, Witten. Attorney Witten, who is, we've hired him for a reason. Um, <laughs> so, um, he would be available for that time, um, and this is really what his uh, role is supposed to encompass in the first place. Would you rather we did it when you were around, Doug? Uh, you know, of course I would, but at the same time, it's the board's schedule that's more. Is the, that's obviously more important. I don't want to schedule a time when the members. Are you the, out that whole week? I'm supposed to be out that okay. week. Okay, that's fine. If, no, no. What about the 15th? You know, picking two dates would be wise so that I can confirm that the auditorium is available. There, there always could be a banquet or something planned. Um, the 15th, I have been asked to appear before the Newton Board of Aldermen to talk about leaf blowers. Wow. <laughs> I am having trouble sleeping with the excitement I feel <laughs> about that. So, anyhow, again, I couldn't be there, but I don't mind you doing it without me. How, how about... Um what about the two Thursdays, 16 and 23? Does that get more of us in the same room or no? 16, I'm fine. That's fine. Amazingly, I'm free on all of these days. When it, is that okay? And the 23rd, 16 and 23. 16 and 23rd? I mean, ideally, maybe if we can get the 16th, because then we could have Attorney Haim here. Is, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Oh, whatever you, whatever you. Whatever. Oh, he's not available 23, right? He's not supposed that, to be I'm available. not, but again, I, I think the emphasis is on. So then I'd say let's have the two board. dates, 16 and 22. Right. Right. Yeah, 16, 22. That's better for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Oh, that makes sense. Good. Can I just ask one other procedure? Because he's not available 23 anyhow, but I think Wednesday might be a better night. But anyhow, yeah. Do you all have an estimate? Um, in terms of after we have this meeting on the, um, whatever date, um, how many days before we send the letter out and or our next meeting before August 10th that the Board of Selectmen will have the draft truncated version of everything that we hear from this hearing, from what we hear from attorneys Heim and Witten, as well as from the site visit, uh, what Greg said in terms of, and I'm the gentleman from Mass Housing, um, in terms of you know what we're going to list and how we're going to list them. Am our, I asking that appropriately? Yes, our, our plan is to have um, everything in the pipe so that as soon as we have that hearing, we have the questions asked and the statements of members of this board, that we're ready to provide you that letter um, in a relatively sh uh, short, quick turnaround, so that you've got as much time to consider it as possible, and that um, you know I believe we have a meeting August 10th, right? Mm -hmm. We have a select meeting August 10th, which is the due date. If for whatever reason we had, you know, major issues, we could, you know, reopen the letter for discussion at that point in time. But I, I, I anticipate us if you having at least, you know, a week uh, of time to review that letter. That's before. what I'm saying. Yeah. If, if we could, the week before the August 10th meeting, That's right. you know, if we can get it earlier in the week, you know, if we don't get it till Tuesday morning or Monday, or two, you know, yes. versus Thursday afternoon, Friday. We're looking at a short turnaround to make you know it a priority. It? Yeah. That, that would be my personal request, recognizing something may came up that we can't do that, and we get it Thursday afternoon. When of course, that's fine, yeah. yeah. 
Edmonton uh, done. All right, just double checking. So is it August 10th, our August meeting? Because I had put into my calendar August 17th. Maybe I've I'm, got, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I've got well, that wrong. I am terrible at this. So I, if, <laughs> like what we're doing probably right now is fixing my calendar. Does anyone have the, uh, we have the August date to verify? Yeah, well, let me just, we said July 13th is the July date, right? That's yeah, what I wrote. I have the 17th for our August meeting. I do too. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I must be okay. working up an old. Yeah, I do too. So we may, so we're probably going to need a special meeting again for to approve if, this if letter. There's, if there's any, so if there's uh, potentially yes. Okay. Yeah. So be it. So we'll potentially need the tenth. Potentially. Oh. Or, uh, or if we're going to do one, we'll be doing the tenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the third or I would the third or sometime. This yeah. Okay, so especially potentially the week of the third. We'll, yeah. we'll just be okay. flexible. All right. Exactly. So we're all. I'll put be on notice for that. that week. So. But again, I, I anticipate us turning this around very quickly um, and processing this, and, and myself yes. and Mr. Witten working together with basically everybody who have hands on deck to make sure that you all have enough time to review and add whatever comments that you have as individuals and then vote on a new support. Okay. Sorry, Joe, did you say you're not available or something? Yeah, I'm going to be away the, the last week of July and the first week of August. So, okay. are you back in? Another part of the trail? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. We're gonna right. hit the road. We'll cross that time. bridge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that said, uh, a motion to receive correspondence. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. New business, Marie. Nothing. Good. No new business, sir. Adam. Simply a thank you again to the board for taking their time out of their Saturday morning for what I thought was an excellent goal setting session. No, thank you. <laughs> Steve. You mean that? Um, no new business, Mr. Chairman. Diane. Um, went to the site visit on June June 23rd. Met, met with the gentleman from Mass Housing. Um, some more than others were appropriately dressed. There were a few people that I think, for their own safety, were told not to go in. Uh, to me, just my own personal opinion, um, having been on the site. I mean, I was completely covered, bug spray, everything. Um, the town manager was and didn't break a sweat, unlike most other gentlemen um, who had long sleeve shirts on and work boots. But basically, the site visit to me was a joke. Um, I'm familiar with that site. We basically did, you know, we came off of the Thorndike Field, did a small U, because I know that area and I take landmarks, and then went and did a wider U and then did a third U where we went to the cusp of the um, tent city, which I believe are in the process of. Um, we're not doing anything about that tent city not. unless the you guys ask us to go into their private okay. property. Uh, and, and to me, what I mean to say, having been on other site visits in Lowell and Lawrence and everywhere else, that was not a site visit. I mean, basically we were following Gwen Noyes from Oak Tree, my personal opinion, where she was just trying to make things look like a site visit. And the other thing that I'm frustrated by where we only have the additional 30 days is of the 192 or 196 page submission when different people like Carol Kowalski and Corey Beckwith and you know members of the ARB, Z ZBA and CONCOM were there as well as myself were pointing out plans that we've all reviewed and were scurrying to, time and time again it was said well that's not the actual plan we haven't designed it we haven't engineered it yet so um, to, to me that I, I won't go any further in that because I think a lot of my remarks and, and what I took away including the gentleman from Mass Housing, Greg. He was a former uh, city planner for Watertown, I believe, as well as, I think he might have spent some time in Peabody and Walden. But anyways, um, I think there is a strategy, a direct out strategy um, that was gleaned from that site visit. And um, I'll just relay that through and, and report that to you all at a bigger meeting. Um, already uh, spoke about meeting with the athletic director at the high school. There's gonna be a lot of um, changes outside around the fields. Um, and she and, and the principal and superintendent, since I've had a history out there with the Warren A. Pierce Field and there's st still some money left, also working with the town manager on either side of, um, in terms of coming up with a parking solution, a place for modular classrooms, as well as there is a shared ownership. One side, I think the town owns a little bit more of the property, the other side by Mill Street, I think perhaps the school does but and then um, I would just ask through the chairman I just heard this really sort of surface and I haven't done any research on it so I was hoping either the town manager or attorney Heim could ferret out first if what I heard is true 
I heard recently that the court came down with some sort of legal ruling on inclusionary zoning. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's a case out of California. California case. Okay. Yeah. Does that apply to um, where we just went in? Well, I, I was just wondering if that had any effect um, on terms of where we just went into inclusionary zoning. And don't answer that tonight. And if it, unless, you know, you know what I mean? Because I didn't give you a heads up on that. But um, I, I just saw in a couple of statewide bulletins that they were saying that ruling that the court handed down out there um, could have some, if not a major impact on some, if not all facets of our inclusionary zoning because it's alike. But that's the person's opinion. So yeah. that's it. How would a California case affect us? If, well, do you want me to, do you want to answer it better <laughs> than I? This is maybe a little bit outside the scope of new business, but uh, there, there, there are principles that might be drawn from it that could, you know, be in, impact us. I mean, even if it's a federal case in California, it's not going to be a case of right. binding presidential value, but um, it could inform. Yeah, Prop could inform 13 me. did bring us two and a half, so. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's okay. it. Thank you. So. All set. Mr. Carroll? No new business. Mr. Dunn? Two items. Oh, I know. It's, well, it's a lot for me. Uh, two meetings I went to a week and a half ago. One was the, mis the steering group for the Mystic Valley lesbian, bisexual, oh, gay, right. transsexual, queer youth meetup group, for lack of a... They have a they're still settling on their name. But what it is is that they, it's a group um, that has identified that in the region there isn't a lot of... Um, social time for LBGT, LBGTQ youth to get together. And so they've put together a Friday afternoon and evening program where uh, these teenagers get together and uh, there's a range of, from arts and crafts to games to conversations uh, with some adult supervision. And uh, so what I went to wasn't one of those Friday events, but was to part of the organization. And it was a really interesting group that was really, I was, really impressed with how organized they were and how connected they were in already to other groups within Arlington. Uh, there's a student there from uh, Medford High who has talked a lot about what they're, what she's experiencing there. Uh, it was a very interesting group, positive meeting, and I basically wanted to bring it up tonight just because if there are other uh, families out there who are looking for social experience for their youth, they're, it's a really interesting group uh, to um, be put together. I should mention uh, Sean Garbley, among others, was uh, at that steering uh, meeting. So that was um, Monday, and then, uh, was it Tuesday or Wednesday, I went to the meeting about the Route 2 Route 16 interchange, the Alewife Rotary, which we all, or not Rotary, the Alewife intersection, which we all know how I love so much. <laughs> and um, and the, the, so they talked about, uh, Will Brownsberger was there, um, uh, David Rogers was there, Sean Garbley was there talking about, um, there's somebody else I should have mentioned. Anyway, uh, the work that's going on there in terms of the reconstruction that's happening right now, it's not a huge difference. It's not a ton of work that they're doing there, but it is going to make things better for some people, in particular the people who are leaving the Alewife parking station who are headed back home from Arlington on the evening. So I was, I was glad to hear that. Uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of nights this summer where the intersection gets closed down entirely. So there's going to be like routing people down and around through Alewife parking lot and stuff like that. And what came out of that was a presentation which I saw got picked up by the uh, Joan and so the, uh, the, uh, the email, the Arlington email list, the town uh, notification list included a link to that presentation. I'm going to say a week ago Wednesday. So, so you can find the presentation with some of the information on there. So inter two, two interesting meetings. Somewhat different attendees. <laughs> All set. So my two, as I mentioned, I've been invited by uh, the chair of the alderman in Newton. Brookline has completely banned uh, leaf blowers, and Newton is considering that. But they've asked me uh, if I would come over and, de and describe our experience. So one of the professional landscapers called me. And to, to say it was a torturous phone call, because he brought up every issue that I listened to for over a year, and I kept trying to tell him, I know. Next, you know, they're going to stop you from using your snowblower. I know. And, and I couldn't stop him from, you know, continuing the same arguments. But anyhow, 
so I, I will be doing that unless this board has any objection to my doing that. And the other thing is you see a chair that we have over there, which is what we give to retiring selectmen. And that chair has been donated back to the town by um, its sisters, uh, Harry, not Harry Barber, Harry uh, McCabe. McCabe's. Daughters, right? Is it three daughters? Yes. Yeah. And we thank them very much. And, um, you know, uh, it's nice that we will get those chairs back to any families who don't want to, uh, you know, um, leave them in their old homes or whatever the case may be. So, so we now thank one of our town meeting members will have a place to sit when he we, comes we to testify. thank them for that. Us. That's right. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> look forward to that. Okay, so we now need to go into an executive session, Doug, for the purposes of discussing. So uh, you'd be going into an executive session for the purpose of conducting strategy uh, sessions in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel, in this case, the town comptroller. Um, we would need to uh, state whether this board intends to reconvene an open session afterwards. Um, if this board intends to approve the contract tonight, or at least considers approving a contract tonight, then it needs to reconvene an open session because it must confirm um, it's uh, basically uh, it's what, what it's agreed to in executive session and open session in terms of executing the actual contract. So if this board is so inclined to move into executive session to discuss um, negotiation strategy of the comptroller contract, um, I would uh, so move and state that we will reconvene an open session, um, regardless of the outcome, just to be on the safe side, and take a roll call vote to, to enter executive session. So move. And is there a second? Second. Uh, does this contract become public? This is it will, yes. Okay. So I'm going to roll call. <coughs> yes. 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 And paid cable. Okay. Speak All right. Uh, so I reconvene this meeting of the Board of Selectmen for June 29th. I will now entertain a motion to approve the contract as amended for our Comptroller Richard Biscay. So, so moved. So moved by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Is there further discussion? All those in favor, Actually, please. Mr. Greeley, just for the sake of the record, let's uh, talk, uh, note the change. Could we have uh, Doug run through the changes briefly? <coughs> okay. Yes. Um, so these are the amendments. Yeah. yeah. The board made the following amendments, um, <coughs> all administrative in nature. One, to clarify the, uh, the renewal uh, period so that it, it, it is not necessarily annual. It's, it's reviewed on, uh, renewed on August 1st, which is not the one-year anniversary. Uh, to clarify that the annual leave is annual leave, 25 days per year. Uh, to clarify that the 3.4% um, um, increase annually is 2% cost of living and 1.2% uh, a step increase under the contract. And finally, to strike the word secretary in front of ex officio. Thank you. Uh, except I don't think it's consistent that steps are always 1.2%, is it? Doesn't that no, vary? No, the, the history, recent history has been flat dollar amount. Okay. But, but it does vary. Thank you. My apologies. So, as amended on the motion by Mr. Byrne and seconded by Mr. Dunn, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Um, okay, I will be in touch with Mr. Ms. K tomorrow and uh, let him know what we go with this evening. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. The next meeting of the Board of Selectmen is July 13th. Yes. Adam and I will be in touch. Good night, Arlington.